Mike's on. Welcome to the um, Board of Selectmen meeting for September 24th, 2019. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, first of all, I understand that there um, are some technical broadcast problems with the hearing tonight, so I guess people at home will probably see this on a delayed basis. Um, I think the audio is working, but the Comcast transmission has got a glitch or two. So, having said that, when people are able to see this, they'll know why they weren't able to see it live, hopefully. Um, first item is public announcements and comments. Does anybody wish to be heard? Just me, I guess. Stephanie Cox, Yarmouth Port. Um, and just wanted to um, hand, I think that um, the town minister is handing out a copy of an invitation that um, Cape Housing Institute, um, which um, in this case is being held by uh, Housing Assistance Corporation, is putting on and would like to personally invite um, each of you to attend. Um, it's November 15th. Um, and if you may recall, the Cape Housing Institute is something that was uh, put together uh, in the past couple of years. There were more extended um, seminars over weeks at a time. We kind of got the feedback from a number of public officials that that was just a lot to ask of volunteers, as such as you are. Um, so we took that feedback and really redesigned it, um, including a lot of the content, um, put in a one day in a one day training session. Um, so I just want to. Uh, uh, let you know this is you know not just sort of another conference though we do have the aspect of having um, you know someone high profile there we'll, we'll have uh, Secretary Keneally um, it's free to municipal officials um, and we're really trying to get decision makers like yourselves there we're not just looking at housing through the lens of capital A affordable housing but also the, just the totality of the housing market um, you know as you probably know in the past um, five years we've lost Cape Wide through 3,000 year-round housing units and gained 5,000 seasonal ones. So as units go uh, on the market, um, the people who are buying them are coming in with with more you know, as cash buyers and um, with more ability to, to outpace um, year-rounders. So we need more options for year-rounders. So we're looking at the totality of the market. We're looking at um, how it intersects with things like our wastewater planning. Um, so lots of new topics and um, this is really meant as a, as a training. Um, and lastly, I'd just say that um, we're hoping to have a nice cross-section of selectmen, planning board officials, ZBAs. You know, we've sent it out um, to towns, but um, any effort that you all could make and try to get um, more and more decision makers there, we think it's really important for everybody here to hear all the same information. With that, I'll say thank you. Right, thank you. Anyone else? Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Jeff Colby, Public Works Director. I would like to invite everyone that uh, might be listening and, and certainly anyone uh, here tonight to the DPW Open House tomorrow night, at that, which is September 25th, 4.30 to 6.30. It's at 507 Buck Island Road. It's an opportunity for people to see the existing facilities and equipment uh, in advance of the uh, vote at town meeting on the new DPW building. And if for some reason this uh, transmission is delayed and people hear it after uh, tomorrow night's meeting, there will be another open house on October 26th for those that aren't able to make tomorrow night's. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, you, you already did one. Am I correct on that? You didn't you do one over the weekend? Yes, that's correct. We did one, one on Saturday, so, so there's a series a of, three of three that we're doing good. this I round. went to one. Yes. It was about a year or so ago. I forget. It was in the winter. I think it was in March. That's correct. We did a couple last March. And That's it right. was um, a picture's worth a thousand words. It's it's a good thing to see what is being discussed um, on the ground, so to speak, and talk to the people who work there and uh, absolutely talk about problems, talk about enhancements that need to be made, improvements, um, equipment. I, I thought it was very informative, um, and I would encourage people to actually go to one of these sessions to see 
what it is because in the abstract you hear oh we need a dpw building and it's going to cost 14 million dollars and just doesn't have a lot of uh, connection to people so i would encourage people to get down there and see what see what is there now and compare that to what is being proposed absolutely we have plans for the new facility to show people as well <coughs> thank, thank you. you anyone else okay i see town council's here hiding behind the pole over there um, like all good lawyers, he's hiding. Um, we have a number of matters um, to talk about. Amendment to the no parking regulations, um, parking clerk discussion, and license agreement related to the Parker's River Bridge construction project. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We had a meeting today with town council, Phil Magnuson, myself, and uh, Ronnie Ramirez to revisit the... Uh, parking regulations that were talked about last meeting and I think uh, as a result of that meeting we wanted to put in your hands tonight a revised version of the regulations that uh, uh, Phil has uh, generated that makes more sense of what we voted on last week and we also discussed um, the uh, legality I suppose of um, having the, the uh, easterly side of Center Street no parking at the $35 limit we determined that that was okay to do if you so wanted to do that as you voted last meeting that's been incorporated into here uh, as well and um, so essentially if that's you still want to keep that we could post the signs uh, uh, soon to uh, begin that enforcement the other activity that we discussed was uh, going through the the parking clerk designation process and I wanted to, uh, an opportunity uh, I think for a lot of different reasons it makes sense to stay with the police department and in both Phil and Jay can talk to the due process process that was brought up at the meeting last uh, last time um, but in the end if you were, wanted to have it stay with the clerk's office we could make that work too so uh, with that I'll um, turn it over to Jay and for Phil Jay yeah, so I'm, I'm more happy to respond to questions. I think the, there's a, there was a few issues out there. The one question regarding having the parking clerk function stay with the police department. I know there was a concern that it seemed like it was the um, fox guarding the hen house, perhaps, or a due process concern. Well, it's not unusual. We actually did a little bit of a survey as to what different towns do and is probably more common than any other agency to have the police do it. Sometimes there's a completely detached uh, parking clerk person, but it's certainly not uncommon. It, it's a little less typical to have the town clerk do it, but we've saw some of those examples too. Um, so it really becomes a policy question. The, the due process is that they have a right to appeal if they don't like what they're getting out of the parking clerk process which has a its own hearing process but if they are not satisfied with that they can go to superior court and get review of that decision How so much is that going to cost them well it's a certiori appeal more or less so it's Filing a fee is going to be about five times the amount of the fine more that, than that probably more than like 10 times the amount of the fine that that would be the case no matter where the uh, appeal generated from whether it was the town clerk or uh, just some other disinterested citizen who was appointed um, the clerk uh, the parking clerk so th that that fee remains the same regardless of the review to the extent that that people might think that it's a foregone conclusion as to what the result that the police department may be I suppose that that is a fair discussion to be had in discussing this with Phil he indicates that there's a fair number of examples where people have over the the, the process has resulted in overturning their own the own parking tickets issued by the town as well as certainly a lot of circumstances where it's been upheld too so it appears that there's been a, a fair review usually it's a pretty routine process I might add, too, uh, if I could, the uh, Phil had indicated, too, in a further review that the majority of tickets that are written are actually written by uh, beach staff for beach violation-related parking, so it's not even related so much to the police-related activity. As well, the cars aren't going to be, cars that are parked illegally out on the road aren't going to be ticketed by beach staff. No, but they generally don't have that much activity that way. If, if I may, the, the, 
the vast majority of our parking violations are written by uh, Parks and Recreation. They have the power to issue uh, citations down in the beach areas. That's where most of the parking problems are. Certainly police officers do issue them elsewhere, but that's a minority. And in looking at after the but, meeting. But Phil, wait a minute, time out. How is somebody that's watching the beach? You can't supervise alcohol as it is, let alone cars parked out on the street. We've had this discussion before with Pat Armstrong about people drinking on the beach, people bringing in coolers, and the answer always is, I can't have people who are supposed to be focusing on the swimmers worrying about going around checking on, it's, on, it's on not people the on the blankets. It's not the who are doing it. It's Dave Carlson and one of his staff, and they're out in, car, out in trucks or cars circulating around the area. But that's, you know, it's another, that's another whole subject. Uh, that's the way it's evolved. Since we no longer have police officers at the beach full time anymore, uh, the board has, has authorized uh, certain members of that staff to issue parking tickets, and, and they do. So, <coughs> are the tickets given for mostly parking on, along the road leading into the beach? It's the roads, and we, we actually had a, 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 a lot of problems this past year. It's roads leading into the beach, blocking driveways down by the beach areas, in interse intersections where they block, where they decrease sight radius, so they cause a safety problem, um, or also in pro prohibited areas. Uh, the entirety of the north side of South Shore Drive is posted, no parking. And the areas right around the intersections are also posted. So that's why in developing the beach access areas, I focused on those violations for the $35 fine, because that's the problem we have there. Okay. Now, and after the vote the last time, and I was, I was pleased to have this off my plate, and then I went out and read the statute and looked at the procedure more, and I was more prepared to talk about fines than procedure last time. And I realized that because we shipped the, the payment and collection function out to the Plymouth County parking clerk, which does 50 towns, and it's very efficient for us to use them, most of the parking clerk's job is coordinating with them for either hearings or potential hearings. We have very few actual hearings, but if people don't pay the fine, Plymouth County sends out a notice that says you have to come to a hearing. So they have to coordinate that with whoever the hearing officer is. 99% of the people never show up. Um, but so most of our job as parking clerk is coordinating between Plymouth, which does the payment collection, uh, and the hearing officer. So if the hearing officer is going to be outside the police department, it makes no sense for the police chief to be the parking clerk. If the town clerk were to be the hearing officer, he should also be the parking clerk so he can coordinate the hearings direct with the Plymouth County parking clerk. I'm, I'm confused. The, the, the Plym Plymouth, it's, so I get a ticket, and I don't, I don't agree with it. So do I notify the Plymouth County that I'm appealing, or do I notify the Goes local initial, police initial, in your example? Uh, initially to the, your red says right on the face of the ticket, you notify the, the local police. If you don't respond at all and don't pay, then you would get it. Uh, oh, essentially coordination through Plymouth. Yeah. That's if I don't... Yeah, they do like the big batch processing okay. of, of multiple violations there. So the notice goes out from Plymouth and the person doesn't show up. What happens then? Then, then Plymouth reports it to the Registry of Motor Vehicles as an unpaid ticket. And if you have, I think, more than three, you've got to do not renew on your registration or your license from the registry. So when you go to renew, then you have to go back and square away the tickets before you can renew. Okay, so... Now locally I get the ticket and I want to, I, I don't agree with it. I don't think I was parked illegally. So what do I, under this proposal, what do I do then? Well, the current practice is that you can ask for a hearing from the, uh, the parking clerk, which is the Yarmouth Police Department, and you go in and you talk to Colleen who handles the hearings. That's your first instance. If you fail to do anything and don't pay, then you get a notice and the notice says you have to go to a hearing. And Plymouth, Plymouth sends out that notice. They coordinate with us. They say, when do you want us to schedule the next 20 hearings? Because they have to put a time and a date on it. Realistically, almost no one actually shows up for the hearings. But they still have to coordinate a time to schedule it in case someone does show up. And that's a local hearing. 
why, 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 why does a hearing get scheduled if, if the person does nothing? It would seem to me that with a ticket, it's incumbent upon the person to get the ticket. That's if the statutory they, scheme. It's a fail-safe, Mike, as far as I can tell. I had this kind of the same concern. If you already blew it by not responding, what? why do you get the right for a hearing? I think that goes essentially to the due process part of it. It's a second bite at the apple to have a hearing on it and have it reviewed. And then failing that, then the, the registry finds out. Now, if you appear and are, are dissatisfied with the results, they uphold the ticket in whole or in part, and then you have a, the right of appeal there to the Superior Court. And this is not our procedure. With a several hundred dollar filing fee well, but you could, it could ticket. You could have 10 tickets, too. I mean, it could be ticketed several times in a so, but you're right. It, but people do appeal tickets, and out of principle, it is not uncommon. And the chief has, have, has authorized me to say that we are not looking to hang on to this function. It makes a lot of sense for for us to do it. It's worked so far, and there's reasons why the police department is a good place to have the hearings, because we have people who are familiar with the roads. We have the ability to go out and have someone check to see, see how wide the road is, see whether the sign's in place, things like that. So we, we have the ability to handle them, but we're not looking to hang on to this function if you want to delegate it to someone else. In Barnstable, it goes to the Planning and Development Department. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we accept the uh, parking regulations as presented tonight and leave the function as it is. Um, with the police department. I think it works. If there should come a time where it no longer works or your concerns, uh, you know, come to fruition, at this point in time, we've never had any problems. I, I, I feel that they give a fair, it, there's a fair process in place. My only, my only concern is I really don't think these fines go far enough, but it's a start. We have a second. I'll second it. Okay. Any, anybody want to be heard on? I have no comments. No, I support the motion. Okay. The only thing is, is there's a question mark in here. Yes, I was going Center to address Street that. To when I drafted this, I didn't know what your decision was going to be. Well, it, it's from Center Street to... So it would have to be after Beachwood Road, comma, the east side of Center Street from Gray's Beach to Homer's Dock Road. I'll eliminate the question mark. Correct. Right. Thank and you. And you'd want to fill in um, the chief of police in paragraph number one where there's a blank. Correct. And the other thing I want to bring to your attention is that when I presented it to the board last time, it was apparently confusing as to what fines applied where. So I reorganized it. I've left the substance the same, but reorganized it and put in paragraph two, which makes it clear that all the regular fines apply everywhere but where the beach access fines apply. Thank you, Phil. I guess I only have, you know, Tracy mentioned uh, concerns about the, uh, some of the fines. I, I'm just looking down the list, particularly in item six, parking within 10 feet of a hydrant uh, blocking a fire exit or fire lane, uh, dropping down below, parking on a sidewalk, parking on a crosswalk. You know, I think there's more to those in terms of public safety issues that, uh, to me, uh, those, those in particular, and there may be others, but those in particular are bothersome to me uh, at that level. I, I, I discussed this with the chief. He felt that the $20 fine was an adequate deterrent. I also want to point out that these are the fines that apply to state highways under a state regulation. Okay. So what we've done is we've copied the state regulation and applied it to the town. Okay. Okay. All right, any, any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? I'm opposed. So it's a three to one vote. Thank you. So I guess the next one is license agreement. Yeah, the next one, Kathy Williams has some details. She's been working with Jay on a license agreement to facilitate uh, Parker's River Bridge replacement. 
Good evening. <laughs> um, I think, as you all know, we had been talking for a little while of the work zone for the Parkers River Bridge is so confined. The uh, contractor really needs a place to have their staging and they're storing their equipment um, and whatnot. And the drive-in site has been seen as a potential location for that. They submitted an application for use of town-owned land and identified the areas that they were looking at, and it's included in your in your packet. Um, town staff met. We had a wide variety of input from town staff from uh, planning, conservation, DBW, police, fire, DNR, and health department to kind of look over that request and make up some, um, some conditions and some recommendations that they would like incorporated into the licensing agreement. And what you see here um, in your packet also is a draft of that licensing agreement that outlines those requirements. It also included some great things from, from Jay with regard to insurance, um, indemnifications, um, but we also wanted to be sure uh, some of the other conditions from staff is making sure that the property is is accessible at least a large portion of it for special events that we want to have on the, on the property and also some requirements of how we would like to see the area restored upon completion uh, of that work the applicant has the applicant is MIG corporation who's received the contract for Parker's River Bridge um, they wanted to have the license through January of 2022 which is when they think they'll be completed with the bridge it is going to be a two-year project because we need to construct one half of the bridge uh, at a time there's also some requirements in here with regard to the health department for fueling and um, containment as well as a dewatering plan. There's also in the in the back here the plan showing um, the area of the drive-in site that would be utilized for staging uh, as well as the remaining area that would be open for special events. I make a motion that we support the licensing agreement and authorize the, either the chairman or the town administrator to sign it on our behalf. I'll second them. Okay, so they're going to operate just to store equipment, basically, right? They're very limited on what they can store here, and it's it's in the actual um, licensing agreement. Near Route 28 would be their office trailer, and they would probably also have some portable toilets behind that. And then the larger area in the back would be for staging, stockpiling, and materials and equipment storage. One of the things that the uh, contractor did ask was that no fee be required um, for this uh, because it is a town project. And they did also note that uh, they did not feel that any type of security deposit was required because there's already a bond on the project. So just to clarify that, there is some language with regard to that in, in the um, license This is usually agreement. fairly standard. I'm surprised to even see a license agreement. I mean, usually it's just, they're just allowed to do it. So I think that this is great. Okay, so we have we have a motion uh, to to support this in a second. Yeah, I have one question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, how long it can it, can you restate the time frame that we're talking about? It's basically immediately uh, through January of 2022. Okay, is this going to have an impact on other people being able to utilize the site for? concert shows or whatever one of the provisions of the license is that they would coordinate with the with the town and event sponsors to allow for access for the remainder of the site most of those activities happen on the weekend and they're not working on the weekend um, but we did include some um, information here sent to just let him know mig corporation that the property uh, may require some setup and breakdown during the week day for the event special event so the contractor is well aware of he that is well and is willing to work with the town so that if we do need to make an accommodation yeah. for some festival or some other event that's there that that's not going to be a problem i think he would then be contained to his particular area which i'm sure he would also want to secure um, and have he has fencing around that particular area well the fencing is quite extensive Oh no, it's not the red line. It's the no? um, that's that's the event space from the standard event. It's the blue line, the encroachment area, encroachment area two, which is the, the triangle, oh, there and is. encroachment it's area one, which is near Route 28. Yeah, I think no. I'm getting, I think I'm getting colorblind. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Very good. That answers my question. Thank you. Did um did you get any input from the drive-in site utilization committee? Um, yes, we did. Um, one of their, obviously, their concerns is they just wanted to make sure that it wasn't going to be interfering with their special events on the site. And I think we've done everything we can to accommodate the contractor's needs and also accommodate the special events on the site. Okay. Okay, any further discussion? Do you second the motion? Yep. Okay, all those in favor? 
Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? So that passes unanimously. Does this mean that um, Mr. Knappick yeah, can sign it? Sign it. Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're done. I guess the uh, um, next one is the DY update. Yeah, I added that to the agenda in case you wanted to discuss uh, the three town partnership meeting that was held last Thursday. Um, <clears throat> all four of us were there with representatives of um, Dennis and Harwich and also staff from, from the various towns and also Tim Whalen and a representative from Senator Sears office and, and others to talk about um, the Dennis Harwich Yarmouth partnership agreement and actually the presentation that we got to prepare for the meeting was probably more in depth than the one that they gave at this meeting which was good because it's always nice to know that when we're getting briefed that we're getting uh, a pretty comprehensive um, recitation of what's going on um, Harwich is already partnering in part with Chatham for for some of their soaring, and um, they seem to be the questions from the public that that I saw coming actually exclusively came from from Harwich Harwich people, and they didn't seem to understand a lot of the details. And I I think I talked to Norm a little bit after the meeting and others and, and I think that all of us have to do um, a good job with with public outreach but I think in Harwich in particular if, if those questions were representative of the public at large and that's hard to know um, mm -hmm. they seem in particular to have have a lot of work to do there um, Do we? I, I don't know if it really pays at this point. I'll defer to the board um, to get into all the specifics of of what's envisioned in the partnership agreement, other than to talk in generalities, because that will be covered hopefully in future um, outreach meetings. But I I think it's it's going to be a challenge really to. Um, to get the public uh, to be aware uh, of the specifics of the project in terms of the capital outlay, the operational costs, what savings are to be gained by having a regional solution, what funding opportunities may be there based on a regional solution, um, and grants. Um, versus going it alone which is another alternative to have to have a treatment facility on buck island road in in Ave yarmouth um, run its own treatment plant which it's anticipated will cost more money in terms of the operational cost certainly where where that's the big savings apparently from a regional approach is not so much on the capital outlay but on the on the operational costs several million dollars a year so um that's just a quick response to the meeting i don't know if the others want to add to that mark do you have anything further um well what i'd like to see if i'm, I'm going to limit my comments mostly to a uh, process um i would like to see us sort of figure out amongst ourselves with Dan and Rich, um, sort of what our time frame is, because we're going to have to make a decision on the agreement, and I think there's an expectation that uh, we should come together and have a have a recommendation in December. So the question I think we have to ask ourselves is, what will the board find sufficient in terms of briefings, discussions, before making uh, making our own uh, decision? Uh, in terms of going forward with the agreement. Uh, I definitely want to hear from the Water Resources Advisory Committee. I know they've spent some time on this. I think it would be helpful for us to have a conversation with them about this. 
I think one of the things that we're going to have to be cognizant of is how this fits in uh, with what we have coming up at the fall town meeting with the diff. I think people are going to be interested in knowing how some of these things tie together. So I think the board needs to be briefed on that. So, um, uh, but we should at least try to shoot for creating a deadline for ourselves. Um, but I think what I would recommend as an agenda item is maybe just having a frank discussion amongst ourselves as to what some of the key questions are. Uh, what are the factors that will influence our decision? I've heard some commentary that perhaps the amount of savings here in Yarmouth um, is in question. They, the, the, there's some that would like to see a larger amount of money being saved for a regional facility. I've heard that. Um, I've also heard concern about the size of the board. Um, so there may be an opportunity for us to maybe not only talk about, identify the issues amongst ourselves, but then have a conversation maybe with the Water Resources Advisory Committee and staff over their commentary, their, what recommendations they have. Um, you know, to what degree might there be potential for additional savings? So I think what we need to do is identify a time frame and maybe identify a couple of meeting dates where we can go over our own questions, review them, discuss them with Dan and staff and have some informed discussion from the committee because they, they're certainly spending a lot more time on this question than, than maybe we are. Um, the agreement itself overall I don't think is that complicated. There are just a few aspects of it that require some significant discussion. Um, I'd also like to think that let's assume that we all come together and we work out and we hammer this out, we're all in agreement, then I think the other question is sort of the outreach. Um, I think the outreach I think can be improved and the public information out on this can be certainly much better. Um, and so I think this, that's, that's a work in progress. I know Rich is working on that. There are others that are working on that. I know our, the three, this has come up in our three town discussions about having uh, more resources made available uh, for someone to handle public outreach and public information. And so I'm not going to uh, sort of t steal their thunder, but I think, uh, I think there's growing recognition that we need to do more in terms of public information and awareness particularly on this this part of the overall project so so those are those are some of my in, initial thoughts um, on, on, on on this subject mr. chairman sure. yeah I agree with mark on uh, a number of the points that he's uh, brought up I I have um, I want to come back to the public communication uh, uh, part of it because I think that that's a s very significant issue um, <laughs> I, I do want to see a presentation uh, from our consultant with regard to how we came up with the projected gallons that uh, our community is going to use in this partnership. I'd, I'd like to see a detailed calculation of that. Um, I want to know that the projected capacity that we're going to be utilizing is um, reasonably accurate and that we're not uh, um, relying totally on um, his expertise, one person's expertise in coming up with uh, our participation since we're going to be contributing 50, Five. 55 uh, percent of the total. I think we ought to know the details of exactly how that calculation is, is uh, uh, occurring. Um, I am also concerned about the pace. I, I think that we've got to be very cautious about being um, that our that our pace is uh, at the slowest participating community's pace, um, and uh, and is uh, constantly delayed by one more uh, uh, issue. And 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 I think. Um, We've got to identify a, a, a pace that we're comfortable with, and if if we need, uh, you know, seeing the reactions very honestly and very frankly at the uh, uh, meeting uh, last week, it, it seemed that uh, Harwich residents had some significant concerns, uh, a lack of information, um, and and we're looking for a lot more details. I think our community will also, but but I think that. Um, you know what I was reading into that is that maybe Harwich is is uh, 
a ways behind in their uh, readiness to move ahead. And maybe we ought to be thinking about uh, uh, a secondary agreement that is Dennis only with a future possible buy-in from Harwich um, and uh, see how that would uh, affect uh, or whether we can, we can accomplish that within an agreement. Um, and I'm just laying out uh, concerns. I'm not uh, dictating anything at this point. Um, no, but that becomes that becomes a <clears throat> the next logical question if Harwich, because Harwich has already started their soaring. Mm -hmm. That's and right. In, in fact, I think part of the confusion um, from some of the Harwich residents in the audience was the. Um, the schematization of this project was laid out in phases, phase right. one, Terminology phase two, was really et cetera. An issue. Yeah. And they've already done phase one in Harwich <laughs> by right. partnering with Chatham. Yep. So the consultant was trying to say to them, well, for you, phase two is phase one. Yeah. And um, th th that seemed to generate, I mean, it's, it's not yeah. a huge transition, really, logically, to to, uh, to fathom that, but it seemed to bother the people there. Right. They seemed confused. Right. Yeah, I, and you would think, you know, particularly since they've begun uh, the wastewater treatment process in Harwich and connecting with Chatham, that they'd be at a point where this second yeah, step would be, uh, <laughs> yeah. would be even easier, but I, I don't yeah. know. It didn't come across that way. Maybe it was just a confusion being created by the terminology. No, but, I... Uh, I, I too had some concern about what the commitment level was. But again, we don't know um, with a small sample of people asking questions if that was representative of the community at large. I'm concerned about it if it is. Mm -hmm. You know, The third area that I would uh, uh, raise as an, uh, one that I would like to see followed up on is with regard to our um, the weighting of the participation in the uh, uh, governing committee. And um, I, I think we need to have a weight that is based upon our 55% share. So if we have three representatives or four representatives, that's fine, but their votes should total 55% of the total. Um, and okay. uh, and uh, similarly, you know, if, if uh, you know, one community is 15 percent, and they've got two representatives. That's fine. They're worth seven and a half percent each. Um, okay, so that's like the commission. That's that's how they Cape, do it. Right. The Cape Cod right. weighted that's voting. Right. Yeah. I, yeah, and, yeah, I see. What you're I just saying. think that that's uh, that's something that our community, uh, our our residents should uh, um, feel that they're fully represented uh, on, in this process. So I'd like to see some follow-up discussion on that. Um, the last thing is you know, public communication, and, and I think um, if we need to hire a public relations representative or if we've got to hire, uh, find out how much it would cost to send out, we've got 11,000 households, um, roughly 18,000 voters. If we put a, um, um, a, you know, a, an explanatory document, one or two page document in each person's hands, how much would it cost us to do that, uh, to get this out? And I think that that's the sort of thing that needs to be sooner rather than later so that people's awareness is immediately uh, drawn to this and so that they um, have something in front of them and that uh, when they come to public meetings, uh, they're aware that this is a hot topic, it's, it's thing, something that is uh, critical to the community and that we're, this select board is working on uh, and that um, um, they can expect to be asked to participate in other meetings uh, so that they can be brought up to speed. But, but I think that unless we provide every household with some some basic information about what is going on, um, I, I I think we're doing a disservice to the community. Uh, I've been asked by people that that I thought were very sophisticated, in in 
uh, knowledge uh, and uh, uh, awareness of what was going on in the community. And I've been asked, what's going on with wastewater? And this was just last week. So and that's after articles in the newspaper. Uh, and, you know, I, I just um, uh, that's very frustrating to me. Uh, and um, I, I think, you know, we, we need to do something about it. And we need to, uh, uh, you know, I, I think we've got to include the expense in, in the work that uh, are in the um, uh, uh, part of the expenses that uh, the, the, the grants cover so that we get this done and uh, get in front of people adequately. So. I, I think a, a written communication to the community is would not be a waste of money. I think that it would um, uh, be a, a kickoff for further communication and more awareness uh, of, uh, of what information is available. So. I think that's a great point, and, and I think you'd agree we're not trying to take anything away from the, the very good outreach efforts that are already underway. Right. This is just, I mean, people, I agree with you. I talk to some people that really are very intelligent people um, and generally well informed um, but they do not seem to have a real grasp of what's going on with the wastewater so I agree that um, you know your your suggestions um, could help uh, go a long way in terms of getting that information out to people yeah thank you Tracy well <clears throat> I'm not going to reiterate everything that's been said, but the Tri-Town meetings that we have should focus specifically on the agreement. I think each town needs to do their own education. Having that much information when we're all at different stages, different funding, it's way too confusing for people. So I'm not sure that was really beneficial exercise. We didn't hash out any of the things as the three towns um, needed to talk about at that meeting. So. <clears throat> that's disappointing because I think that was a good opportunity for us to be having a dialogue amongst the specifics because we keep moving the goalposts here we're not getting to a point where we can agree on something so that brings me to the next point is how do we educate the public when we haven't really come up with a plan first I think that we need to work quickly to come up with our own plan um, but there's nothing worse than putting out bad information so you know and and, and it, and also it brings me back to where we were before I, I do think when we have a plan and we're ready to hit the road with it um, I think what they've done so far has been fabulous because they've talked somewhat in generalities and getting people's awareness peaked but um, I think sharing the website with people so as we develop um, but right now I think there's more questions than answers mm -hmm. and um, I'd be afraid of of confusing the public so I think we need to get on the same page and then once we are we need to forge forward my concern what I was going to say before is going back to the previous vote that we had we had been criticized heavily on shoving things down their throat mm -hmm. and so I think we need to be careful that people don't feel that way I mean as far as information goes um, I think that's important to put out uh, but um, I, I'm concerned about hiring somebody at this point in time. Let's just say that. I think, Tracy, your, your remarks kind of tie together um, what Mark and, and what um, Norm have both said. I think Mark's agreeing with you, saying we need to get a time frame yes. to get this information well, and establish at our last meeting, we a, asked for a some position. Information. We, I, I don't think any of us are sold on the numbers yet that we've been presented in the Tri-Town uh, thing. And if I remember correctly, Dan and Rich were going to work on that, hone it. I know Norm would like the flow numbers. I personally would like the numbers behind, you know, I know I talked to Rich about it at the Tri-Town thing. I'd like to see what, what that looks like. You know, we get one number. I don't know. That I would like to see the details behind that. So I know that there's some things that they're going to work on and c get back to us with, with a recommendation. And I think once that recommendation's been made, you know, uh, those points that Norm brought up about the weighted stuff, you know, it's unfortunate because we've, we've been at this already what, two years. So 
to go back. I think it's going to be difficult now, but we we need to keep pushing forward and, and working <coughs> issues. That would have been something that would have been great while the three boards were there to have a discussion on, but there wasn't really an opportunity for it. So I think what Norm's suggesting makes a lot of sense. I think, however, from looking at it from the other town's point of view, right now they're proposing three representatives from Yarmouth and two from Dennis and two from Harwich. They're going to say, well, if you get weighted voting and you get 55 percent of the vote, what's the point of having a vote? Uh, Yarmouth will just dictate what is going to happen because they have the controlling vote. So I think you're going to get a lot of resistance there, although, you know, the commission does weighted voting, certainly, and uh, there, is, there is a lot of logic to s behind saying that if you're paying 55 percent of the bill, why should you get less than 55 percent of the say? Um, but I, I would anticipate, and, I, and I'm not challenging your, your, your reasoning there, Norm. I'm just saying from, from a political standpoint, uh, I think we'll, we're going to get a lot of resistance on that. Well, I, I understand that uh, and uh, can certainly see why there might, might be some resistance. But on the other hand, it was only two months ago that Dennis insisted uh, that we have a, um, uh, uh, a drawn-out process for approving every uh, annual budget. And uh, we had to come back to this uh, board uh, during that time period to okay that. So I, I don't think anything's over until it's over. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we just saw in the last uh, 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 discussion of this a couple of weeks ago that our percentages have increased. Uh, and uh, I think the time is, is, is very appropriate, 55%. Uh, uh, um, we ought to be asking for greater representation. And, um, you know, I just, uh, I, I'm not trying to uh, dismiss other communities' concerns. I think that the, um, uh, every part of the agreement <coughs> where a majority vote is, is uh, called for or is, is allowed can, can be changed. To, to require two thirds, if that's necessary. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, so uh, uh, because we have 55% doesn't mean that on every critical issue we would uh, be able to use that 55% to get everything passed. If, if there's a two thirds requirement, it would require uh, another community to to agree. So, so I think it's a it's a matter of what each particular um, section of the agreement calls for. Um, so, um, but my point is one person, one vote, we should, our community should, should uh, uh, insist on that principle. One person, one vote. And uh, we should uh, uh, have the representation on that, com that committee in accordance with, with that principle. And I, I think that's the way we should go. Um, you know, to Mark's point, too, about the percentage, I think that I am have to say that I'm, once I see the numbers, I think maybe I'd feel more confident in the percentage. But I, I, I do think, based on our experience, and this is it's not saying it's a great project to regionalize, but, uh, but at what percentage is that you know that worth it and i don't even think that's a discussion for us i think it's a more of a community discussion um because you know obviously it's a lot of money no matter what percentage it is one percent is a lot of money but um <clears throat> you know I, I guess i'm hesitant based on what we've been through before and so and um, based on the past few contracts um, that have come out that have been many percentages or a few percentages, I should say, over the estimate, that percentage could decrease very quickly. So say we enter into an agreement thinking we're going to save 10 percent and, you know, the project costs five more percent than projected then we're down to 6%. I know Rich's argument was we'd be paying it anyway whether we did it ourselves or not, but that's where my mind is, so. 
Yeah, contract escalation <clears throat> will will the cost will be there whether we do a regional um, solution or a Yarmouth only solution. That's for sure. Nothing's going to go down. Anyone else? I think to Norm's point, we have to nail down the methodology for these calculations on our projected shares of this um, treatment plant and the operational cost of this treatment plant and get a, a detailed analysis of how those numbers are arrived at. Um, also, Norm, uh, would that apply to the recent increases in those numbers well, it for, apply, for not, not projected that, but, development? But also to uh, how are the uh, 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 gallons volume uh, for the other communities calculated? Do we have a level of confidence that those numbers are accurate as well? Okay. Is the same met methodology followed, or did just, just you know somebody raise their hands and say, "Well, we'd like." X number of gallons. I mean, what what was the the uh, what was the method of, of determining that that uh, projection? So. Each town calculated their own gallonage. Is that correct, Dan? Yes, uh, I believe it. Uh, the each t the towns of Dennis and Yarmouth added a little bit more based on their economic analysis, but essentially it was derived. The base consumption was derived from the raw water meter rates that went on with the people and the, the meters in the proposed sewer districts. And then there was some X variable associated on top of that, I believe, Jeff, if I'm not correct. When you talk about the proposed sewer districts, are you talking about all, all of the phases? In those phases, yes. All of all, yep. the eight phases? Uh, all they identified the watersheds and then the phases, yeah. There's four in the first one that we're talking about at the plant, though, right? Well, I, I don't know, Tritown? Sure, to answer Dan's question real real quickly, it's actually a slight reduction based upon outdoor water use. They don't just take all the water use. It's actually a slight reduction. Usually it's 90% of the water usage is what you base for your sewer flows. But it is based in all three communities on the water usage, correct? Did that exclude the golf courses? <laughs> it did. We couldn't make it one conversation without the golf. Yes. <laughs> Again, th the plan is to exclude that exterior water use and only what would be used and go through a sewer system. Okay. And that's an entirely another conversation that Jeff. Some, some communities have to talk about because some allow dual metering for outdoor water usage, correct? And some do not. That's correct. Each community has to decide which way they want to go with that, absolutely. But well, we can certainly, at a future meeting, have the consultant come in and explain in detail how these calculations were done. We had had a presentation on that some time ago, but that certainly, uh, as we're getting close to the point where we're needing to go public, uh, with much more specific information, that's something good to get out and memorialize in the public conversation. Yeah. How do we separate out our outdoor water usage from our indoor water usage? What, how do we arrive at that 10% discount? Uh, that's just typical uh, engineering industry standard calculation. At this point, we don't have a separate metering system, so there had to be some assumptions made. Okay. Hmm. What I think we might want to do, if we're going to have the consultant come back on that issue, is to find out what other questions that we have that we want them to come back on, yeah. get those questions consolidated and give them mm -hmm. to them in advance and say, we'd like you to come in and we got these five areas or whatever. In the meantime, we'll go back to the main DHY sub-working group with some of this feedback and get, uh, and get that out into uh, that conversation realm so that those folks can take it back to their individual towns and we can eventually get some feedback on that. So that'll occur right away. And back to um, Mark's point, I think we're going to have to get some kind of a, a timetable yeah. in mind. Um, did you say we're supposed to be making that recommendation by December? December. Yeah. Yeah. So I think so we there's probably, not much time left. No, and plus we need to at least get back with the, going back to Tracy's point about the, the select boards needing to engage with one another. And, uh, you we know. Probably we, we need to have a meeting. One yeah. or two meetings of that sort, I would think. I think, what Tracy, I think what Tracy was saying is that the, I, I think she was saying that it was not beneficial to have the select boards discussing all of the towns 
um, levels of participation in this without really having the opportunity to have each town look at their own numbers, their own costs, their own advantages and disadvantages to go in. And, and maybe I misunderstood her, but I think she was talking about breaking out the Armith component of that and having more in-depth discussion. Which I think it's makes a lot of for sense. Any, for uh, any of our people to watch a presentation that talks about how Dennis is going to fund theirs and how they're doing betterments right. in Harwich, it's not, it's not productive. It's confusing. Mm -hmm. well, how they want their f a member of their finance committee on the board. <laughs> well, I, I think if I may, uh, the, really what it'll end up coming down to is the board's discussing these elements of the agreement that will likely be sticking points mm -hmm. that we'll just need to hash out face to face amongst each other you know okay yeah i think you know i um the meeting i think that we had kind of turned into a, um, a harwich only meeting uh and and that's not to criticize the whole thing it's just uh, uh i'd kind of like to see if we're going to have uh a meeting of the select boards we have a round table mm -hmm. Uh, so that everybody's uh, facing each other can uh, feels comfortable yeah. communicating uh, over uh, to ideas. that point I think we can agree that what we can do is propose to the larger group that the boards come together and we do it by breaking out and going through the agreement and coming to terms on the things that we are in agreement on and then spending right. the majority of time on the things that we're on disagreement that's so that right. we can walk out of the room with a deal or whatnot you know that sounds like a good can we process. make that our second our I, I think that's great, but I think first it would be nice to have our own your recommendation, <laughs> the, the diving into the numbers and our confidence sure. in that oh, absolutely. first, yeah. Yeah. and then go to that meeting, yeah. for me personally. Understood. Yeah. No, I agree. I, I will say, having been part of this for a long time, something has gone off the rails a little bit in Harwich, I think is fair to say, that uh, they had a lot of momentum on this topic early on, and I do know that... Uh, they, uh, the group that was originally set up to go over this, their water resources group has been, from what I understand, disbanded, and some of the finance committee members haven't been as up to speed on it. So I think they've got some internal challenges, and I'm not sure if it's related to the heavy cost escalation that occurred in some of their sewer phases early on. I think that was taking them aback a bit, to the, almost to the point where, like, people just, we want to put the brakes on until we get this thing done over on the east side of town, you know. So we'll try to find out a little bit more detail. But they clearly, we have, I think, overlapped them a little bit in uh, in pacing now on this topic. Yeah. 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 Well, well the, and it's not a, it's not because lack of commitment. No, understood. No, yeah. Their yeah. community, right. I think, at large, has taken uh, some big votes. Big votes. No question. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I think the pace of this has also been affected by the pace of the legislation. I think we had thought. Yeah. yeah. And maybe those were maybe expectations that we should not have inflated or escalated but i think we had i don't all think we would have been ready for it anyway i mean even if it was done now we still have the same no conditions. i understand i understand but True. i think to some degree uh the, the the pace had had the legislation been approved by now i think the pace of things might have been might have been different that's all i'm suggesting Maybe. i don't want i don't want people to be inter that this is a criticism that the pace isn't the pace is being measured up against the pace of the legislation. I think there's been a concern, uh, at least in a couple of towns, that we can't get too far ahead of ourselves in terms of moving this all along. So this is the challenge when you get three towns engaging in a partnership and a conversation about how to do this and how it works. Um, but I think what we're being told right now, what we were told at the, uh, the other night, is that the legislation should be done this year. And uh, to me, there's nothing about the proposal that would suggest that it couldn't be done. Um, I know I that I know they have a lot going on, but this is this is the kind of thing. This should this should not take longer than November, December to get to finish. You know, and the, I think the question we have to ask ourselves: do, do we need to spend a little bit of time there? You know, having a delegation from each of the three towns meeting with committee members, you know, in the in the Senate to help move it along there. Sometimes. Sometimes just showing up and setting up meetings and showing a commitment and an interest uh, can make a difference. So I, I think that's another thing that we might want to think about doing as a, as a board and as a group is offering to join with a delegation with the other towns, Dennis and Harwich, 
to go there and talk to legislators, uh, particularly the, the we're right now it's in a Senate committee, and uh, it might be helpful to meet with the committee chair and staff and uh, see what the holdup is, see if we can kind of nudge this thing along. Um, I'd, I'd prefer to be doing something along those lines as well while we're coming together and lining up the questions that we have amongst ourselves that we can sort through and get answers to. So I'd put that out there. And maybe that comes up in our next DHY meeting, Dan. It could. I do know Senate Council had some really minor commentary on the legislation. It's been addressed. Jay's got a copy of it. KP Law went over it. So uh, we weren't expecting Senate Council to have any commentary on the legislation, but apparently they did. And in the end, I think it's really minor to the point where it's not slowing anything down, but it was just another step we needed to get over. And they just heard back from the town councils that they're good with that change and keep moving, keep moving. So just uh, lawyers, okay. you know. So All right. I'll check in with the staff. So do we have enough guidance for, for the team? We have enough guidance. Yep. What we need to do is any other questions or issues that we need to discuss or get yep. clarified, we need to get that information to you right away. Yep. And so one of us, someone has to reach out to Eric to make sure that we've got a handle on his questions and concerns so that we can yeah. we can yeah. do that as well. I can, I can talk to Eric. Okay. Yeah, we should give ourselves a deadline. So if, you know, I'd like to think that we've been at this enough so that it doesn't take too long. Uh, to get something to Dan. So I think I think there's two there's a technical questions that Norm has brought up about computations and methodologies that are involved. And I think the other thing we have to do is get the questions we have about the agreement. And we have to do that right. as a board. Yeah. Right. Um, with whatever information we need from staff or the consultant. And then consolidate those questions and then sit down with the other groups and tell them what our concerns are. Actually, um, yeah. Right? I, I don't think we should probably have a ton of them. I think there are some major points, some of which have been discussed here tonight. Um, but you, you raised another interesting point, Norm, about the weighted voting, and, and I didn't think of that, and that is that you could have certain issues not be predicated on a simple majority vote, but it, right two-thirds right. vote or whatever other percentage or, you want. Or the weighting could occur, uh, relate only to certain provisions. Right. You know, uh, you know there's, there's ways of doing that, and I haven't thought that through totally, but, you know, it might, might be worthwhile uh, to, to look at that and say, okay, when, you know, where is it important to us to have uh, the full weight of our uh, percentage uh, of the, of the uh, uh, gallons <laughs> in this, so... Okay. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Sure. Go well, ahead. we have town council in attendance and being respectful of his time. I'd like to have uh, on the agenda item the uh, election warrant brought up uh, just so you can sure. review it while the council's here and also the uh, town meeting warrant, uh, which I have a copy of for your review. Okay. Is that in our packet? No, I have the, the election warrant uh, is in the town meeting warrant is coming out to you right now okay on the election warrant uh, we discussed with um, the clerk today uh, the ballot question language yeah that's in your packet um, this language was generated by Bond Council, uh, a very respected entity uh, amongst municipalities. We had a uh, conversation uh, related to whether or not to put in the dollar value proposed uh, while we were there, and uh, the question came to us from Bond Council with uh, location to have a dollar value put in there, but further review of the statute indicates that on this type of debt borrowing you didn't necessarily have to so jay and i just wanted to review that with you as it relates to the upcoming election 
I'm going to go over that, Jay. Yeah, obviously there's some value to putting the dollar amount in because it really lets the voters know what they're voting on. Um, there are other ways to alert them to the dollar value, such as an explanation accompanying the vote, the same way you might see in a referendum petition that shows up on the ballot. The curious thing about debt exclusions and overrides is the, the form of the ballot question is actually the opposite of what you would think. You would think on overrides, operating overrides, you would just you wouldn't have to put in a dollar amount um, and that on debt exclusions because it's a specific amount of money you would but the opposite is true you have to put in the dollar amount on the operating override even though it kind of gets buried in the budget um, and the the levy limit floor but for debt exclusions you don't technically have to I don't think there's a penalty or um, a prohibition on putting the value in especially whereas here, the dollar amount actually serves to describe, help describe what the debt exclusion is a little bit. And if bond council uh, approves it, then I don't have an objection to it. That said, you don't have to have it in there. It's really just the permission to exceed the levy limit. It is not the appropriation itself. That will happen at town meeting. This is just the permission to um, borrow outside of the levy limit. But being, being in the ballot, I mean, uh, if the do dollar amount is there, it defines the amount. Up to. It does, but, the, but, the, but that's not what the ballot question is for, technically. Technically, the dollar amount's already been taken care of at town meeting. The ballot is just allowing you to go outside of the levy limit. Okay. Th that said, again, there's value in having it there, either in the ballot question itself, because people look down and say, oh, I know exactly what I'm voting on, right. or you have the pr right in the ballot itself to have a short explanation as to what people are voting on to a certain degree. Uh, it might be easier to do it in one step and just include it. I'm just suggesting to you, you don't have to. But the bond council has approved it with that d the dollar amount in, and I see no reason not to include it if that's what you want to do to help the voters understand what they're voting on. Granted, so the dollar amount's nailed down at town meeting and cannot be changed. Th that's correct. That's the appropriation. Right. But you could do a, a town meeting article that says up to. So you cannot. I thought that that's how we had done it before. Well, that's what the article says, but the actual appropriation itself will be specific. Okay. Okay, so we have the specific appropriation that's locked in at town meeting, and then the question is only whether that um, defined amount is included on the ballot question or not. Well, so it's not going to change. Town meeting way. gives you the authority to borrow as up to a certain amount. You Correct. may not ultimately use all that money, and you right. could rescind some of that borrowing authority later. But that's what it gives. the The ballot question, and then that town meeting vote will say contingent upon passage of a proposition two and a half debt exclusion. That'll be in the motion. The debt exclusion question on the ballot is really just for the purpose of letting the people, um, the voters of the town, make a decision as to whether or not they want to be taxed beyond Proposition 2.5 for a specific project. You have to describe the project, but you already did the dirty work, so to speak, at town meeting where you actually t did the dollar amount. So if they're paying attention to town meeting, they'll know what that amount is. One. And if they didn't pay attention to town meeting, they'll have no clue what they're voting for. Uh, correct. Wouldn't stands to reason why would they come and vote for for something necessarily? But yeah, people do show up. So again, th there, there is no. I have no quarrel, provided that ta um, bond council has no quarrel with including that in because it is. You do have to describe what it is that you're excluding from the debt, and the fact that one of those descriptors is um, the dollar amount is, does not appear to be prohibited. It's not required, but it's not prohibited. This, so This would go out in a notice, a legal notice, yes. with, with or without a dollar amount as we decide. Correct. And, but in the legal notice, if, if we decided to put in the dollar amount, at least saying to the people, here's what is coming up in a yeah. vote. Again, I, th I think it was Dan's 
feeling, and I think it's an appropriate one, that why not put it in there if it's, it helps inform uh, the voters either positively or negatively on the project, then I think that, that could only be a good thing. I think Ed has a comment. Uh, just as a point of uh, historical reference, I think what we did with the Cape Tech and the DY votes is we didn't put the amount in. Um, the Those are different, though. Yeah, understood. Yeah. I think just a historical reference of where we got to here. So um, I think you weren't really happy about that. I think you had preferred that the amount be on there, even though, say, in the uh, DY vote it was on the second ballot. Um, so when I gave it to bond council, I went ahead and put the amount in there. And then they went through the language to, to make sure that it was appropriate so that we could actually borrow because we don't want to actually do something that would, wouldn't allow us to go back and then borrow the funds. So this was a reaction to um, you know, your thoughts based on how we had handled uh, uh, different, uh, ballots in the past. So that, that was kind of something I threw in. But uh, this is clarification that it's not needed, and it wasn't needed in the case of the DY and some of the other votes. So it's, it's your preference, what you, what you think is most appropriate. I would expect you're going to get more people vote at the ballot than you're going to get at town meeting. Yes, that, that's, so maybe, that is historically maybe so. the case. Yeah, historically true. Yeah. Substantially more, usually. Yeah. So um, people might say if they don't know how much money is involved, they might take the, the, the line of least resistance and say, I'm not going to vote for this because I don't know how much it's going to cost. Or the alternate could be true as well. It could be. It depends what you think is a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. what, what is the dollar amount? Well, so that's a discussion topic for tonight is to decide <laughs> uh, if you want to go this route. Well, you would want to decide tonight on that dollar amount. We have I'd sent out a memo to you a couple of days ago outlining a few options associated with it. Uh, also tonight, uh, Ed has uh, some projections, some borrowing projections that will help. Uh, before you make a decision if you want to uh, provide any pay down opportunity. I, I personally, uh, when I was discussing it with Jay, I mean, it's a big dollar value this town uh, is undertaken, and I think uh, there's a certain uh, fiscal transparency that the board has liked to see mm -hmm. uh, since I've been here for sure, and this is just another way to reinforce letting people know that this is what you're voting for, and frankly, this is how much it's going to cost. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, can I just make sure. a couple of questions? First of all, as far as the wording goes on here, it says um, Department of Public Work Garage and Office Space to be located at 507 Buck Island Road, 507 Buck Island Road. So that needs to be taken out. And then um, the last, very last sentence on the first page, it says the Yarmouth Register or the Cape Cod Times at 14 seven days before. What does that mean? 14 days before, I believe it is. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah so it need, the last sentence, uh, Tracy's yeah, right. A, there's a typo there where there's it says typo, how much right. lead time you have to give. Also, by publication, you have register on the Cape Cod Times. It's either 14 <coughs> days or seven days before the time of the right. meeting. What's the legal requirement on for, publication? For the, for the town meeting itself? This is the warrant. No, it's this is on the town election, election notice the, on the ballot question. Um, I believe, well, we, there, there's 35 days lead time for, for you to, to call for the election, but it's this 14 the, days. This is the, the, the newspaper notification. This is the publication. It says at the, at the end of it that, um, as Tracy's pointed out, it's talking about publish, posting it in, in four public places. And then it says, and also by publication in the Yarmouth Register or Cape Cod Times, at 14, then the next word is seven days before the time of holding of said meeting as aforesaid. So it is, it's one or the I other. So it must seven. be. I know maybe it's twice. How many days is it? We just need to look I'll, at I'll, I'll verify it. I just want to make sure that there were consistent across both debt exclusions and general election stuff. But I believe it's, I believe it's 14. It's got to be 14. Seven isn't much notice. Yeah. Right. It might be two. I know usually we did it in two papers. But just as another thing while Jay is here, um, I have filed a, a public disclosure form and I always get. I would just want to say, because there could be a, uh, an appearance of a conflict where the company I work for could potentially bid a project like this. It has no financial bearing on me, 
whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, I have nothing to do with the bids. I have nothing to do with the results of the bids. But I think for just public di disclosure, um, I know I've, like I said, I've, I have filed previously that I just would like to say if anybody on the board has a problem with that, that's fine. Again, it's procurement law. Nobody has any advantage, but it could appear that way. Okay. Jay, you have any comment on that? I don't. Okay. And you follow you followed the rules and the proper disclosure, so could it possibly be fourteen and seven it based be. upon the I don't I don't that? believe it it's no, twice. I think it's fourteen. <laughs> yeah, I think it's fourteen. I think that's a typo. We'll make okay. the uh, we'll amend it as appropriate okay. to the right. law and then get to I think there's probably a um, a template that for some other thing had seven and yeah. you know, the seven didn't get deleted. Happens all the time. All right, so we're going to hold on this and go to the other item that that we, yeah, have, the, for, uh, that we have Jay captive for. That's the warrant. Jay's been working with us on the language on the articles that appear in here. Yeah. Um, the only one that uh, was kind of late in developing was the uh, last article related to um, the DIF presentation, district in, uh, increment financing or improvement financing from last last week. Um, but that there is really what I'd call uh, Jay assist me here that but we wanted to keep that as generic but still met the standard of the re, of the legislative requirement to get the diff language on to the town meeting warrant but not have so much detail it would completely uh, confuse everyone I do plan on having uh, speaking with uh, Dan Horgan to have a, a map uh, visual so that people can see this before it goes up. And then uh, we talk about what the uh, the diff would do and what it means, and they'll see a visual rendition of it, and it'll be explained by town staff. And we also came up with the calculations. Thank you to all the departments that generated that for the free cash request associated with the tornado recovery. I had someone ask me uh, if there were provisions of uh, the diff with regard to state and federal taxation that we were not aware of? I don't, uh, the, this is all, this is just simply identifying a location for a future plan that would be put forward at a future town meeting to describe the how the infrastructure would be financed in this plan. I'm not aware of any impact on federal yeah, or the state other, taxation. What gets a little confusing perhaps is uh, one doesn't have necessarily to do with the other with regard to a diff versus the opportunity zone but this diff falls within the opportunity zone uh, where there are tax advantages uh, capital gains advantages for increases in value but that theoretically has nothing to do with the diff it's the fact that it's in an opportunity zone okay so so the diff in, in itself does not convey any special advantages no Okay. Can I just ask about, are we going through article by article? If or? you want, sure. Well, on article two, <coughs> um, it says, or any other sum. That's a language that we've had from other articles of similar situations. So, you know, part of on this question, um, we don't know what number you wanted to put in there, so we would put that in, but that or any other sum is carried over from other standard articles like this. What does that authorize, Jay, or any other sum? Anything. Well, I don't. It, oh, I don't have a, actually a Sorry, copy here. of the warrant. I've got an extra one. I'm holding out on you. You can't read our mind. <laughs> article, <laughs> Article Two, J. So normally, what we would do for this in the article stage is just not even put in a dollar amount at all. So this is a way of preserving kind of the scope of the article question. So you'll see a lot of Warren articles at the annual town meeting or a special town meeting and just to see if the town will appropriate a sum of funds to defray the costs and expenses or to pay for a capital item, whatever it is, without putting it in. And all that matters is that 
we put it in in the motion. If you there's a rule of thumb that is that if you do put a dollar amount in an article that that does more or less frame the scope of the article for the moderator. So if someone if you put in here 18 million dollars and someone said I I move to reduce that by $4 million, fine, it's a lesser amount that would always be within the scope. If someone said, well, I think that we should have more, you know, more uh, accoutrements in that uh, DPW building, I'm sure Jeff would like that, and I want to, I move to increase that by $2 million to $20 million. Some might say that the voters did not have sufficient notice of that additional amount, and therefore, if they knew it was 20 million, they would have come out and voted no or yes, as the case may be. So while you can increase it, it can't be so much that someone couldn't have reasonably <coughs> contemplated and, and that amount. So I think the, the use of or any other sum is a way to have a little bit more leeway in that to give the voters some notice that this number is the best we got so far. Mm -hmm. And it's important for us to give you that transparency by letting you know what we have in mind, but it may vary a little bit by the time we get to town meeting. So will our warrant right. be printed prior to town meeting? Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. then that yeah. solves a big problem because if they were allowed to go over that amount, our ballot question would no longer be valid or for that amount that was approved. For that dollar, so that's part of the equation. So why to, wouldn't you do up to like we had done in the past and remove the or any other sum? Well, there might be a, and I hate to jinx it, but I, there might be a situation where the bid openings are October 16th. So we're gonna know what the cost of the building is after production of the warrant. But Mr. Chair, if, if I may, to that sure, point, sure. we'll have a more accurate number that could be replaced in the motion that's from true. town meeting floor. That's that right. was the intent of uh, pursuing it in this uh, with this process, so that we'll have, this is more or less a placeholder at mm -hmm. this point. It, we could have yeah. a better number. We will have a better number for town meeting. Okay, so that's why we put any other sum in case the bids come in over that amount, or in case there's an amendment up or down, right? Okay. Well, right. Again, an amendment down wouldn't wouldn't, wouldn't affect the, the scope of it. An amendment up, I, I think. do think you're giving the moderator a little bit more leeway to accept motions if for some reason the, the bids all came in at 19 and change. Well, be, to be clear, once we walk out of town meeting, that number's locked. That's it. Yes. Well, yeah, but... I mean, that, that's where you're... It, it could come in under budget and you could rescind some borrowing authority later for it, I suppose. But, yes, that is... That makes the ballot that well, much more difficult. So it does. So, you know, so I would ask if we left the dollar value off of the ballot question proper and just put in language as an explanation as it's anticipated that the building could cost a sum of money like $18 million and, Seventy-nine thousand dollars. So would that maybe be a safeguard in case we? It had certainly is a safer thing. Now, it always depends on timing. Yeah. If you know the amount and you know it's only going to be so much, then then that's fine. Otherwise, sometimes the ballot isn't set given timing of things until it won't long be. enough. Yeah, we won't have enough time. If you come in one dollar over that, it's off. That's the problem. They have that. to. They yeah. The yeah. the ballot is far more fixed yes. than the. So than the if the bids come in at if we print or uh, approve 18079 at town meeting and we put that's it so. but if you left the amount out and then parenthetically say it is estimated that the cost would be approximately and give that number you'd be okay wouldn't you in the ballot question? Yeah. No, you can't. You I wouldn't. Make, you don't make the amount part of the ballot question. You, you explanation. You leave the exact amount out, but you you can state what you th think the anticipated. There, there is a question. certain amount of leeway that that Phil has to put some explanations in the election notice as to what people are voting for. We can we can we can look at that a, a, a little bit. So uh, I think one of the options that I, I believe you'll be discussing shortly is that we're telling the taxpayers what we'll borrow up to what you have and the ta taxpayers have the ability to do is to use other supplemental sources right. if we find that we need to go above 
what has been authorized for borrowing to actually supplement to get a project done that they want to get done. For, I mean, they, the, the voters could, uh, if, if presented with an article that town meeting in May, authorize another X amount of dollars out of free cash or a stabilization fund or capital appropriations fund some other source. Well, we do have that. We have that article on this special town meeting that you could do on, from the floor. We, we've, I've queued it up to consider capital stabilization, free cash, or even Chapter 90 borrowing. But how do you sign a contract when the money hasn't been appropriated? Well, so interestingly, this we're all talking about a hypothetical number right now, but by October 16th, we'll have the bid open. We'll go to town meeting with what the dollar value is, and I'll just play this out. But say it came in at... 18 and a half, 18 million 500,000, then we would know going into town meeting we could use some supplemental funds to bring the number back down if we decided to keep the ballot question at eight, up to 18 or 18,000, 18 million 79,000. So we do have that option. We'll walk into town <coughs> meeting with the estimate in hand. But not the supplemental approach. No, we do. There, there is an article that would allow you to make a motion on town meeting floor to access free cash. Capital stabilization. Okay. And Chapter 90 is an administrative function. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense then. Yeah. I mean, you, or, or you could do it under this article too, if provided it didn't exceed the, the the scope. And we would just have to be careful that the amount that we're doing as the contingency for Prop Two and a Half would only be the amount that's on the ballot. Well, I'm just. I think we need to be clear to the voters what this building is going to cost. Whether they, sure. you know, mm -hmm. whether they raise or appropriate or fund from free cash if it en ends up being 25 million and we're saying it's only going to be 18 i think that that's problematic for people that's problematic for us yes <laughs> <laughs> i agree but you know they don't they don't want to hear after the fact when they only voted a certain number or whatever so i think we have to be as clear as possible so jay going back to the special town election the arm um special town election do you recommend we leave that number out? Well, again, the, the, because I'm generally con, confined to taking the most conser giving the most conservative advice, you know, from a legal perspective, and if you want the least number of variables possible, I would leave the amount out. If you're concerned that the voters might look at it with blank stares or some portion of them and would benefit from having the amount in, then you put the amount in, and if it happens to to be more than that, then um, then we'll have to, if the cost of it, then we'd have to account for that at town meeting with a supplemental funding source. So there's ways at it. It's, it's a little few more variables. Um, so the, the simplest and cleanest way is to not have the dollar amount in the ballot question. Now, we're allowed to give out a flyer. You absolutely are. So I think that that's something that we've done in the past. We used to have this problem all the time because we used to have to print. The, we, there was never enough time before between the town meeting and the warrant, which is why we changed town meeting so we don't have this problem. We can print the ballot after town meeting has been decided. But there have been times where the numbers have went down and we've given out flyers. So I think if we leave the number out and then we have information provided with what town meeting's action was and what the actual dollar amount was and how, you know, break it down for people. At the polling can, stations. Yes. Have it available at the polling yes. stations. Does anybody know what's a reasonable variance from that number that's in the article? I mean, do we... Well, we gave you a low value number based on the lowest value from the independent cost estimator and the high value from the other independent cost estimator, and it's a range of two million and change, I think. So, one and a half. One and a half. So there's a one and a half million dollar hmm. very It's um, a big variance. Yeah. I do. I, I think if we went just to wrap that election ballot question up, if we went with no dollar value associated with it to selectman post point, I think we could generate an explanation that would occur at town meeting floor. So anybody that's going in with a ballot, they'll get a statement that says, this is what the vote's all about, you know? That's the only way to do it. Mm. Yeah, and I think that makes so perfect confusing. sense. The only problem I, I have is I don't know how many people are not going to be at town meeting that are going to be voting. A lot. Usually it's, usually we have, you know? we might have 300 people at town meeting and we'll probably have 3,000 voting. Two to three, maybe two, but still. There's yeah. 
but we certainly can put, I think you could, I don't see why there would be a problem, an explanation in the polling booths. So as they fill out the ballot, they would be able to I see the explanation. Have to have that. Yeah. We'll look into that, see what fills. So um, yeah. yeah. Can can we agree to leave the amount out but provide an explanation as to the cost um, on on the ballot? I think we have to. Can we do it that way? I you know I, I guess I'm I'm I very uncomfortable not having the dollar Number. amount in there. I just. I just uh, think that uh, we advertise something in the paper, we get the dollar amount in front of people, we ought to have that in it. And, and, and uh, you know, it just, I'm bothered not uh, uh, telling people exactly what they're voting for. I mean, that's the preferred way, obviously, but we, we have some so. logistical problems in terms of the bids, the opening of the bids. You, the timing of the of the election and the town meeting and so forth, um, and and having to potentially make up um, the difference with other funding sources, it gets a bit complicated. Tracy, what were you going to say? Um, how, well, how do you want to resolve this, one way or the other? Do we? Put the number in, um, or do we leave it out with a, an explanation? I think those are the two choices. Uh, Norm says he'd like to leave it in. What do you say, Mark? Well, I, I'm comfortable with leaving it out. Okay. And then providing an explanation. It's not, Jeff. What is? Uh, we were just discussing another complication, and that is what has led to some of this previously when, when Phil Gaudette was here, mm -hmm. is the absentee ballot issue. And those get printed two weeks ahead of time. And the question, I think, needs to be the same as what's uh, on the ballot question at the polls. So that's a challenge. So, so you would, could do it with a handout at the polls? Or Which you wouldn't have it for the absentee folks. Well, they're going to get a ballot with no number. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think going back to the very beginning of this conversation, we did talk about on the ballot itself a small statement as to the anticipated Well, I, I think what they're suggesting, though, however, is that we may not know that cost because town meeting would not have happened yet by the time they have to print the absentee ballots. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? That's correct. I mean, it's pretty close to that two weeks. I think the board um, was uh, appreciative of the absentee ballot issue when, when Phil was here presenting that. Um, and I think we could do that explanation with the absentee ballots, but again, it would be a very short turnaround. The bid opening is the 16th of October. Uh, absentee ballots, we wouldn't be able to have available till that number was known if that explanation needed to be included with the absentee ballots. So you're do we have enough time, Dan, given the schedule? If we, if we wanted to have with the absentee ballot some discussion of or some explanation? We can. We would just have to delay the absentee ballots till that was available. Right. Absolutely. And it would be about two weeks. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we were always in the same time frame because we were anticipating right. the absentee ballots to be back on, I think it's the 21st of October. Right. Right. So bid openings are the 16th of October. We would know that, right. and we and there's not going to be a tremendous rush on absentee ballots. I would not imagine that we couldn't handle. Yeah, talking with Phil today, um, his preference was um, October 8th oh. to have um, the ballots done and to the printer. And uh, uh, Selectman Post, just to your uh, point about the duration, a lot of that's driven by the amount of time the bid is good for from the RF or from the RFP or the uh, bid process, it's only good for 30 days, so we couldn't have more space between when the right. bid opening was and when we had the election, so that if was. If we don't get the ballot right, we could, yeah. that could be all for nothing. Right. So yeah. we and don't want to waste that exercise yeah. either. So, so and that's why, you know. Could you do a different handout with an absentee ballot that would be more general that says, sure. here's our projections, it's all going to be based on 
town meeting, yeah. at least they'll have a sense yeah. of it could be 18 million. It could can you be do that? Can you have a different explanation, Jay, with an absentee ballot than you have in a regular ballot? Well, I think it might be we're talking about a potential insert, not something right. printed on it. I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. It's something that I could work with Phil on and and provide some uh, more guidance on that. I don't know. Uh, honestly, if they can get information that's different in some way, shape, or form than what we would otherwise provide. Um, there's a couple of, of issues. You know, we'll have to examine exactly the lengths that we can go to. We're not advocating for anything, more or less, but providing more information to a one type of voter than to the other it might be somewhat difficult. Um, I'd like to think we can. But I want to be careful. So it, I want to talk to Phil. And this is part of, I think, the overall discussion that we all had, which was <laughs> um, if we had an up to number for the debt and we got surprised pleasantly on the downside for the bid, we'd be in great shape. If it went above the uh, $18 million and we committed to the fact that that's all we're going to borrow, and then at town meeting, um, if we needed more money than, and, this, and you folks and the voters were willing to go above that high side estimate that we currently have, then you would have the flexibility to do that. But the ballot <coughs> would limit the total amount that you could borrow. So, do we have it's a million and a half dollars that we can get from other sources if we yes. go over by that projected percent? Well, we've already uh, put the borrowing estimate at the high end. The high end of that one million and a half dollars. Let, let, I, I want to just reiterate: the the ballot has nothing to do with how much you can borrow. The ballot has has only to do with how much you're excluding from debt. Right. Right. So, you can choose to exclude in through the warrant article. For example, the motion could be, and. You know, provided that this uh, appropriation is contingent upon excluding from debt the sum of ten million. Let's say you choose to use several other sources, and then but only exclude from debt a, a certain portion of it. That can be done. So the ballot question is just excluding a uh, whatever the warrant article says you're going to exclude from the levy limit. It, it says no, it's not authorizing borrowing at all. That comes out of the warrant article. And within the warrant article, you have, you can choose to borrow or you could choose to use ex existing uh, funds that might be available, as Dan indicated, Chapter 90, capital stabilization and free cash. And that's what Articles 7 and 8 are, Dan? Uh, it's, let's see which article it's at. Uh, I think you have two different... Um, yeah, seven. Yeah, it's Article 7, yeah. Right. In Chapter 90, uh, Jeff had indicated to me his uh, expenditures are the discretion of the town administrator. So if the board authorized... Isn't Chapter 9, Chapter 9 is the road, right? It's road money, but it, oh. but a portion of that <coughs> is used to pay for equipment in the, in the housing of the equipment in the building itself. So you can borrow against an appropriation. So essentially, just hypothetically, you wanted to use $500,000 of Chapter 90 money from the 2020 allocation, we would present that to the state and they would uh, allow us potentially to use $500,000. So you just, that would mean, that would be that less that would be used on road repair and road related exactly. activities. Exactly, that brings right. us back. And we've already had an override for road repair, which we earmark specifically. Well, I'm just saying it's an option. That's, you know, it's another uh, trying to estimate the worst possible scenario here so the the, the uh, 1.2 million dollars of road that's that's not what we're talking about we're yeah, talking about the, the supplemental is over the chapter yes. 90 yeah. well, i mean okay. that's semantics you're taking it from the thing that we needed it for right okay okay it's not, not taking it from the 1.2 i understand but that but it's again it's semantics it's the same pot of money so the with the inclusion of article was it seven seven that makes up for the supplemental funding um yeah is is that enough to um 
warrant that we leave the sum in Article 2. Because you said that's the higher end that you anticipate yeah. already, the 18079, right? Yep. Plus, you got the buffer with Article 7 to right. make up anything over and, be, over, over and above that. Pro provided that we avoid a situation where 2 passes but 7 fails and we don't have enough money. <laughs> or somebody reduces to. You reduce don't have enough in the end. Yeah, but you could still take up that at the annual, right? No. Well, you, I mean, you could, depending upon the contract that you're signing. I mean, it, there's a number of variables here. But we could also, we have some leeway in Article 2 to consider other sources as well. It says appropriate borrower and or transfer from available funds. If that number is variable, some of it could be by borrowing. Appropriate by borrowing, X. Appropriate from uh, the capital stabilization, Y. You know, so we could do it all there and skip over seven altogether if we wanted to get the vote uh, cleared up right then and there. I think there has to come a time, too, at a certain dollar amount that we need to decide as a community, regardless of where we take it from, what the value of the building is. I mean, obviously, that's for the people to decide, but, um, you know, when we started this process, we were looking at $13 million. Now we're talking 18 already, and that's a lot of money for a building. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's not needed, but at what point in time do we have a fail-safe to say if it ends up being $22 million, then what? Is that? That's a problem. I'm just, I know, but I'm just <laughs> saying at some point in time. Back to the drawing I haven't board. really thought uh, that uh, dramatically yet on this topic. but <clears throat> Again, we'll know on October 16th. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but whether you leave the dollar amount in Article 2 or not, Mike, I think it says, or any other sum, so yeah. it's, it's irrelevant. You can insert any number there. You can. I was thinking more of the ballot, not, not the article. I was just thinking if, if we have Article 7, can we leave that 18? On the ballot question. 079 mil on the ballot. Yeah. So if we had, an, if we had an, a bid that came in over that number at town meeting, you could work it back with supplemental funds. It might funds not be a dramatic time. number. No, it might not. You're absolutely right. It might right. be a few hundred thousand, something like that, where you can the go The problem is it seven. could come in at 13 or 15, yeah. and then we have a number printed on there that could scare people that... You know and, what I mean? And don't Mike, to your point, oh, you can't again, the, the ballot question is not authorizing anything. So let, let's say for some reason we open up bids and it ends up being $14 million. And that's what the town meeting article says. But you've got a ballot question that is allowing you to exclude debt up to $18 million. Well, if you're not borrowing it, you're not a, you, you have some capacity over and above for that project if you had to if there was some supplemental borrowing or whatever, but it just means that for that specific project, you have the authority to exclude from debt the 18,079,475. It well, does Because mean town meeting is only approved. The, four town the 14. Town meeting is only approved. That's yeah, it. that, that That's really doesn't That's right. That's right. go anywhere. But That's there's right. a the, the only concern you would have is if town meeting made the the entire amount it ends up at 19 million contingent on an override and you only have 18 million in the in the ballot but that's why we have the leeway under both article right. 2 and article 7 to identify some supplemental funding sources to make sure that we don't exceed the 18 million 79 it isn't uh, i mean the borrowing or the uh, authorization for the debt exclusion uh, can't that be reconsidered uh, in terms of amount or amended at a, uh, a, meet, a later uh, town meeting? So in May, if, if let's say that, uh, you know, it came in higher, we, couldn't we amend that uh, uh, at the May town meeting? Uh, yeah, to a certain degree that certain monies aren't yet encumbered by a contract or otherwise. Right. Then certainly, I think the problem though would be the bids are invalid after 30 days. The contractor doesn't hold the price. Yeah, no, I, I'm just saying, is there a scenario where where a later well, town meeting could well, affect yeah, this town guess, meeting vote? Uh, what if you know the uh, the taxpayers say no, we we don't authorize any borrowing. 
We don't authorize any any uh, override. So then we'd be stuck with finding the money. No, you wouldn't, because the entire appropriation is contingent. You'd have no project. No project. Because the, the motion under the article. It's and, really just a supplemental Yeah, in bo both the article and Seven. the motion are going to say that this entire it's project is contingent on a getting the override, too. So it has to prevail in both okay. for the... Mm -hmm. right. For the town, for the taxpayers to be subject to it, right. because otherwise, if it wasn't contingent, then that'd be eighteen million you'd have to cut from something else. Mm -hmm. But I'm still, still, uh, you know, let's again, if the voters voted for an amount today or on November 5th is smaller than the requirement of uh, the bids. The bids come in at 19 million, and the voters have, have voted on a smaller amount, um, whatever that amount is. Uh, they could still go back, or we could still suggest going back, as opposed to using free cash or stabilization, still go back and ask for an amended uh, vote. You have to ask for a manual contract because you can't sign a contract for money you don't have. You yeah, can't you probably sign an have to put it out to contract right. for funds you don't have. have to put out the bid again. Yeah, I mean, there's a million variables that are okay. kind of beyond okay. the, what, what we could imagine here if we sat here all night. <laughs> and we could sit here all night. We could. So I think now that if I could kind of summarize it and we've kind of talked ourselves around a little bit that is would, that that would be helpful I think we're I think we're okay putting this amount if we feel that that's a good approximation in in the uh, ballot question so if I, we're if I, we're I, confident I, that if for some reason it exceeded it then we could use another source of funds I mean that is if we feel amount. that the, that there's value to the voters of having the ballot question list an amount let's go with it and let's commit ourselves to working towards uh, other funding sources uh, in addition to the borrowing yeah. at that time if you are concerned that that is too confusing at town meeting then let's not put the amount in but I think from a legal point of view it makes sense to leave it out but I think from a political point of view Right. It makes more sense to leave it in because right. I am concerned that if people see no amount, they're right. going to look at it as a carte blanche appropriation right. that could mean right. the sun, the moon, and the stars, and they're just going to vote no. No, I would agree. I would agree. But I think. again, I think that it, it, it's problematic because just because they're voting for this 18 million potentially doesn't mean that that's the cost. We could be. We could have already taken two million from free cash in other places. So that's I correct. think that that's really not the cost of the building anyway. That's the price of not coming to town meeting. Oh, absolutely. Should the authorization read up to an amount as opposed to a specific number? Jay, can you write it that way? The authorization in the ballot question or in the warrant article? I'm talking about the ballot question. I don't think so. No, okay. You have to exclude a certain, if you're gonna describe it, you should describe it precisely. Yeah, and then if you don't need that capacity, you can borrow less. There's no right. harm in it. It's just for, so there, there's two elements to the debt exclusion question. The first is it is authorizing you to exclude debt. Right. And that's a key component. The second is that it's describing it with respect to a specific project. So let's say the project came in at $12 million, but then there was another pet project for, and new annex for Dan's office over here in, in town hall for another six million. That ballot question wouldn't be sufficient for that right. because it wasn't described that way in I the understand. ballot. So you can't just freelance with this extra six million in capacity. The, 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 it doesn't work like but that. But if the, the way the ballot changed for an add on for another million, you could, right? The way the ballot is structured now? If you were under. You, if you were under at town meeting? And, and, and yeah, it, it, let's say you voted at the town meeting, voted a higher appropriation, and then there was a change in the, in the um, development plans to go, go a little more high end on some things. 
you could you could borrow that money because it's project related correct i'm not saying you should do that but you could couldn't you I don't think, as long as it's, if it's inconsistent with the town meeting vote. Well, the, the, the town meeting no, it's vote's still under. It's still under. What I'm saying oh, is I if see. you spend the excess I see. on that project, you could do that, right? The ballot language um, that we worked with Bond Council on does say up to. Uh -huh. So that. It does, because I've seen that before. Yeah. Um, that yeah. may or may not be comfortable with uh, with Jay, but that that's kind of currently how how we have okay it. so if we leave and i think um i i'm going to pull up the dy as well and i think um that may have been up to as well so let me and which dy question our dy question or theirs uh theirs theirs was not a debt exclusion question right theirs was just a straight right. appropriation it was. question yes, it so was. that that's not going to bear on it okay all right so but if 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 Rick Manley's comfortable with an up to thing that yeah. that seems to be somewhat inconsistent with what DOR references for these things, but DOR isn't going to review something on a on a debt exclusion like that. It's really for bond council purposes. If he's comfortable with that, then that he, I'm comfortable. He's with. he's looked at it twice. Yeah. Again, it's just a description, unlike an operating override, which where you're required to put in the amount. I just get nervous because if the bids come in at 15 and we have 18 and the ballot fails, are we going to sit here and say, geez, I wonder if it would have been different if we had the right number on there? Cause, well, but we have no way of knowing. That we have no way of anticipating that with the, with the time frames we have. Yeah. Uh, uh, Tracy, you made a good point earlier, though. Th then we can, we can put up All my points the, are good, Ed. We, <laughs> we, can, we, can give, we can give them the handout. Right. Yeah, we can post by the time actual election day occurs. We'll, we'll have the bids in hand, the bid in hand. So we'll you know. think we should print with the, with the number and still do a handout? I, I, no, I'm, I'm, I'm to your point. So if it's close to the eighteen million dollars, we don't have to do anything. Jesus. If it's lower, to your point, uh, so that we don't scare people away, we can give them the handout. Okay. As long as people understand what the other pieces, even if it's lower, if it's higher and we're using money from other places, then somehow I think that that needs to also get out to the to the public, that they, they know what the total project cost is. But Article 7 is just going to be handled internally at town meeting, right? It's not going to go to any ballot. No, but right. that's what I'm saying. We could have I think the hope is that we pass over Article 7 without having to use it. Having yeah. to use yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Again, or if we, we could do handle that, it's not a big number. That's right. But we could handle potential supplemental. We'll know. We can by the time we're crafting motions for a town meeting, we'll know. Okay. okay. So, is it the wish of the board then that we leave the amount in on the ballot? I think that's what I'm hearing, right? That's what you're hearing. Mark, I'm, I'm in favor of that. Mark's in favor. Norm? Yes, Tracy? That's fine. As okay. long as if it's much lower or much higher, we're using it's supplemental sources, we have some way of just yeah, well, we got what Yeah, we got some, uh, yeah, and if <coughs> some explanations to put in order, certainly. Yeah. What would the caveat, if I may, to Selectman Forrest's point? Because I, I don't see, uh, Ed, on the version that I have in the packet, language... It's not up to. It's not up to, correct, right. It's precise. It's precise, right. So what made the packet was precise language. Okay, that wasn't the ballot draft then. Okay. That was the election. Or, okay. Yeah, Yeah. let me let me. If you can just double too. check while we're at the meeting. Let me change that yeah. too. And I'll, I'll forward the okay. email from Rick Manley and yeah. uh, what do we need to Lynn vote Welsh on again. Can we? Um, we want to. Because we're going to fix two typos. Yeah, we want to fix the typos. And I'll put in up to. In up to. As long as that was Rick's, and I'll, Jay, I'll send you. Uh, I'll just send you the the uh, email from uh, from Lynn Welsh and uh, Rick Manley. So do you want to? Do we think we need a formal vote on that? Well, we we will, but can you? Uh, can we move to the, uh, the warrant? Yeah. The next item. Articles, yeah. Before we do that, I think okay. we have everything ready to go, but. Anyone have anything else that they want to ask Jay about on the warrant? Two, uh, the, I would bring to your attention, Kathy Williams had indicated to me, planning board has not yet had a hearing on the two zoning pieces. 
So that will occur, I want to say, October October 16th. So you'll have a, by, by the next uh, recommendation from planning board on that, that's correct. All right, so where are we then on the on the Warren articles? So that was, uh, we, we covered one, which is the agreement, the DY agreement language. That's the same over in Dennis. It's what we voted on back in August. So Article two. A motion to, move to place and recommend Article one. Second. Okay, any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So that passes 4 0. Article 2. Um, we have a motion on Article 2. I move that we place and recommend Article 2 as, as uh, presented to us. We have a second. I'd ask that we place and hold, hold the recommendation till. I'll second it for purposes of discussion. Why would we place and hold it? Well, I didn't know if Eric wanted to participate in his recommendation, but. Oh, okay. I need to have authorization tonight because okay. our schedule calls for going to the printer and getting published on the 27th, three okay. days. So yeah. we don't have time to reconsider this. Well, we can recommend at any time. Yes, yes. Really, I, I was planning on bringing that up at the last meeting before town meeting, the actual recommendations, that provision. That's what you're looking for, right, yeah. Tracy? So right now we have it written such that it'll be recommended from the floor. It'll be printed that way just because we have to go to print earlier. But the reality is we can take a vote on each article just before town meeting and then have it available that I only that said morning. the recommendation on one because we already took a vote on that. Right. All right, so what was your motion <coughs> again, Tracy? Uh, Norm. No, I, I made motion. the motion. Oh, Norm, I'm sorry. Okay. That we place and recommend. Okay. Are we going to, I mean, we debated this thing at length. I think we've, <laughs> I thought we came to a conclusion on this. I'll, I'll second it. Does anyone else want to be heard on this before we vote? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, so that passes. Article 3. I have a question on 3, um, and, and I'm just looking at it very quickly, Jay, but what we're trying to do is we, we have a kind of a, a rare point in time where we have uh, surplus members over seven on our finance committee which it's generally very difficult to get seven but we don't want to lose talent so we might want to add you know one or two members um, but I have a question on quorum I, I believe we were talking about four being um, constituting a quorum in other words looking at those extra positions as kind of a, a bonus if you will we, we're really still dealing primarily with a seven member board no less than seven members at any one time so we don't have anything in here as to what would constitute a quorum i, I think it might be good to say that um, four members will be a quorum because you you may you may get this board quickly to shrink down to seven. We have we have some elder elderly members on the board that may may, may be moving on and will be back to seven. Um, I'd suggest you leave it alone because state law says a quorum is a majority of those then in office. So if so it's nine, it's five. If it's seven, it's four. If what, it's eight, it's a quorum is five. So. So eight would be a quorum of five. Yeah, it's a majority. Got to be a majority. Okay. I, uh, you know, Mike, I gave that a lot of thought, and what I thought about mostly was the idea that um, because it, our bylaws were silent on that whole concept, that it may be best to just be handled by the chairman that sits based on the membership that's presently, such that, like, say we have seven going into that year, you need to have sitting four members to take a business action. Yeah, because I do expect some fluctuation. Oh, I, I don't that. disagree with you, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, you answered my question, Jay. The chairman can make that designation? Well, it's part of the rules of operating the committee, right? So, you know, if you if you, if you have to have a majority, well, it's up to the committee to come up with a particular set of operating principles. Huh. All right, so anyone want to make a motion on Article 3? What Article 3 basically is doing is increasing the number to no more than nine from the seven-member committee, but the committee will be fully constituted at seven. That's the minimum number. All right. I, th I think, you know, at this, at this point, if they say they want to have nine, they have to understand that that means that their uh, quorum goes up, right. and they have to be able to make that at every meeting because otherwise the meetings have to dissolve. And I think it could be disastrous in the middle of winter when the Finance Committee is uh, really heavily involved in reviewing the budget to all of a sudden have a couple of meetings canceled. So, yeah, so they've got me, to be very cognizant of that. Yeah, let me I run this by Jay. So would, could you phrase it such that a quorum is the majority of the members that appeared at that meeting as opposed to the general membership number? So say you had nine members, seven show up. Mm -hmm. Your quorum, I mean, at that point you'd have uh, you'd have more than five. So your quorum should be no less than four. Yeah. Yeah, that's the point. The problem is mm -hmm. is that so um, th there is <laughs> there's voting and then there's quorum. So, for mm -hmm. instance, there is a conservation commissions are treated a little bit differently than some of the other land use boards. There's a weird little regulation for them under state law. I think the regulation is actually a mistake, but it, it functions okay. So state law states, the open meeting law states that a quorum is a majority of the, the members in office, not the majority necessarily as the board is constituted because that is a different animal. That does apply to certain boards. Conservation commissions can take a vote if they're a seven-member board. If there's only, they can take, uh, if their membership dwindles to four, they can still ha have meetings and the quorums are, the, the, the quorum is those then in office, but they could literally pass a vote with two or three people depending on how things happen. I'm concerned about setting a quorum of four for a board that could be as many as nine, because I think that that conflicts with state law. If you have nine in office, if it, if it drops a number to seven. Could you have a quorum of four up to eight and a quorum of five if you had a full board of nine? Because right now that's going to be the situation. Quorum is having. defined under Chapter 30A, I think Section 18, as a majority of those then in office. I can call up the specific statute. And I, I'm <clears throat> wary of developing a bylaw that conflicts with a state law dictate. Okay. So let me just check, though. Well, the the uh, Dan, you're a, a regular member of the finance committee, right? Well, I'm, I'm not. I don't think I'm considered. I'm uh, like a not a voting, a voting member. Yeah, not a voting member. No, just I can just appear. Okay. <laughs> like you and, and disappear. <laughs> well, maybe so. I could participate. Okay. How about that? All right. Yeah. Yeah, all right. I don't. I don't know as a lot. I, I don't know as we've ever allowed uh, a chairman to set that. I would be afraid. Um, and I'm not saying that anything about our finance committee now, currently, or whatever, but I'm just saying in general, if there were people who they, did, they didn't want their vote to count, that they would make up the rules as they went along to make sure that uh, they were excluded from, from that, and I think that that's problematic. So I think, I'm not sure if it's in, the, in our uh, committee charge or right in our charter, but I'm pretty sure the quorums are set. It wasn't in the charter. I believe I thoroughly looked at the charge, though. I did not look at that because it was Finance set in charge. Finance committee isn't governed by state. It's not 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 by the state, right? There's nothing that needs a. There's no, no vote of the finance committee that needs a supermajority. Correct. 
Not a super majority. Okay, or, or, or a, like ours, we have some things that are four-fifths votes, so that, right. but I, I do not believe it should be left are there, yearly. Are there any way, is there any way that we can um, leave the number at seven, but have alternates? alternates. You absolutely can do that. There's okay, no so we could have that. alternates, uh, you know, as many as we want. They and could then, vote if there wasn't. Correct. And I'm so. sure the chair would recognize them and allow those uh, people to participate in the meetings if they uh, so choose. Um, you know, I think that that probably would be a better way to approach this so that, uh, uh, and then that allows the flexibility going into the future. So if we provided uh, um, no less than uh, what's the proper wording? Consider, uh, consisting of no less than seven. Uh, uh, we have seven now. It I know, no I know, uh, but I'm trying seven. to get the the wording for the alternates. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> um, You'd have to say up to two alternate members, uh, right? Which, you may want to then define what those alternate members can do. So sometimes, like for example, the planning board has alternate members and they can step in and vote if there's an absence on zoning matters. But a zoning board cannot, uh, I mean, or, or like a conservation commission does not have alternate members that can step up and vote. Mm -hmm. And those alternate members for a planning board can't step up and vote on subdivisions, but only on zoning matters. So you could define, they can either be along for the ride and it's kind of a training ground and they can participate but not vote. Or you could say, and such alternates um, shall, in the event of an absence of, a, of one of the seven members, may be authorized to act or something like that. I mean, you could do that potentially. Is no. there any reason we have to do something on this? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, you know, we could. Um, I, I suppose we could leave this language as is right now. We could actually make some sort of amendment, or maybe we have further definition of quorum for you at uh, as the meeting rolls through October. Yeah. We can have a further research, and then we can just change this or amend it on the floor at town meeting night. I think the the intent is to provide an opportunity to get more members uh, a more I mean because I even since I've been here there's been sometimes a number of meetings have been postponed because we didn't quite get there and um, and you know and, and so going through this the quorum issue did pop up and I looked at it a little bit with the time that we had but I, I think it needs more vetting and I my own concern with alternate members is sometimes like you know, I know in the planning board piece, they have to be in attendance to actually take that future zoning vote, you know. So how do you, on a very informal board with part-time meeting notes being taken, how do you ensure that? And, and I think the intent was to make nine, up to nine full authorized members. I think that was what the intent of doing this was. And I that think, was. Yeah, we should probably work on what that quorum issue looks like, and then we can get some further guidance. That'd be my recommendation is to keep it as it is. And, if we need to make a change at meet town meeting floor, we could do that. I just looked at the state statute. It, it seems to refer to quorum as being a majority. It doesn't seem to. It does. And then it says, unless authorized, authori authorized by special legislation, general laws, or other authorizing provision. I don't know what they mean by other authorizing provision, if that could include a local bylaw that sets a very low quorum. Um, I haven't seen that before, or if they mean only a state provision. I just checked the open meeting law guide published by the, the state, and I didn't see any reference to what that other authorizing position could be. But it's something we could look at. I, I have my doubts that it could be a local bylaw where you could set a quorum yeah. at two, for example. But I'm happy to look at the question. And I think generally those quorums when they say unless, it generally means that they're going up, not down. I'll take a look at the question. I'm comfortable with leaving it this way. I don't think it references quorum, and I think that's fine because I think it's set by the, rules. the, by the number. The majority, yeah. yeah. If that's a motion, I'll second it. Okay, so we have a motion and a second to recommend Article 2. Is that the motion? Three. I'm sorry, three. Is that your motion? To put it on the warrant. 
but not to recommend it? Yes. To really? place and recommend. She wants to place Want to recommend? and, and sure. recommend. You second that? It's fine. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Four, passage 4 0. I move to place Article 4, 5, 4 and 5, um, and not make a recommendation until after the planning board has its hearing. Second. Okay, to place, but not to reserve recommendation until after the planning board has mm -hmm. its meeting. You're on four and five, Tracy, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll just further discussion on that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? That passes 4 0. Bring this to six. <clears throat> Did we add this? So on Article 6, this is the amount uh, in wages and um, what I would call verifiable uh, expenditures on expenses to date, uh, not, not future projections of replacement of trees down the line and whatnot, but it was, because remember, regular wages wouldn't be reimbursable because it's part of their normal workday allocation, so this would be overtime wages. Mm -hmm. The other piece that's in there, I've asterisk, I put asterisks there on the golf situation. Uh, we have submitted that as a uh, uh, insurance claim, as a business operating that took a loss. Mm -hmm. We don't have verification yet that that would be reimbursed. I would hope, though, by town meeting that we might get um, guidance from the insurance company on that, and then that, and in that case, those items could come off. So this is all storm-related? This is all storm-related, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure that it, it will have to be in the presentation. It's, it doesn't come across in the article itself. Yeah, the article... 384,000. Yeah, for the following purposes. Yeah, I, I, it was a, the, 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 from storm-related cleanup was got deleted off that that was in the original yeah, yeah i mean yeah. you know it it doesn't it, otherwise you know the way i first read this is we were just authorizing overtime no, I'll, I'll make that amendment to it that uh, <laughs> okay it should have been from um, storm related cleanup why are some of these very specific and some of these just general uh are they real yeah well that's uh <laughs> we've gone through this uh exercise time and time again and uh i've asked those departments where we have like a round number to be prepared to explain why it's a round number as opposed to a to the cent number <laughs> okay the tub grinder looks like a round number fifty thousand. don't get me wrong i saw those guys in operation they're a pretty impressive crew yeah, that didn't take long to get that kind of number at 5,000 almost a day, so, yeah. There is, uh, we're working with the legislative delegation to get reimbursement at the state level. As you know, the federal government did not, we did not reach those thresholds, yeah. but there's an anticipation that there'll be a state supplemental in the future, so hopefully we'd get fully reimbursed for these costs. What does that leave our free cash balance at? Uh, I think we're at 3.4 million minus this, so it'd be right around three million dollars. What is an, in the first line of DPW? In parentheses, it says brush and tree disposal and grinding and, and disposal. Is that wages? That's probably the cost of taking in all the brush. Which one is that, Norm? The very first DPW item. Right. Okay, I see it. 87555. Five, five. Yep. Right. If I may, those were the actual costs associated with grinding and disposing of the brush and stump material that came to the disposal area. So is that wages? As well as so is it wages of the people that were doing that? No, that's the cost of having that outside contractor with that tub grinder available for grinding and then hauling away the material. Okay. But you got the tub grind. Oh, that's the equipment rental? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jeff, yeah, just, how, just how is that? either related or different from the item you just you just described it's the one that's down one two three more lines down tub grinder equipment rental for certainly 000. that is an item that has not been expended yet that tub grinder rental is what we expect on the second go round for grinding and disposal of wood chips okay uh, there's still a very sizable pile there which we're continuing to water down okay. uh, but sometime this fall we will be bringing that tub grinder back to grind that up okay uh, that is storm related material that's on site uh, that has not yet been ground so that's what that number is okay okay good i think there was also a question on them and availability too because 
you could only use them for so long because you didn't know what your needs were going to be from that point going forward. And other towns, obviously, were waiting to enlist their services, so you had to kind of wait until they were went through that cycle. Is that, that that's correct? certainly a factor. The other piece is we want to make sure that we have, you know, 99.9% .9 of the material on site. We're still actively cleaning up. I know I haven't given you a report in a couple of weeks, but we're still actively pulling stumps, removing some trees that aren't um, weren't in imminent danger of falling down, but were damaged by the storm. That's still ongoing, including some efforts today. We rented a lift in which to um, remove some of those trees ourselves in-house, really trying to do it as cost-effectively as possible. But it will be uh, a period of time, a number of weeks more of cleanup that's ongoing. Those costs are relatively minor, except for that tub grinder that's still to be um, brought to the site. But we want to make sure we have the bulk of the, like I said, 99.9% .9 of the material ready to be ground so we don't have to go through this exercise again. What was that, uh, is I'm going to correct the end, about 4500 a day yeah, for, something for that? that? That's right. That was the daily rate. Yeah. But they move a lot of material in the day. That's right, and, and we could. Um, that's the other reason for having most material there is they're going to do it in roughly two days. They're very quick about it. We don't want to prolong the time that they're there. We want it quickly done as cheaply as possible and get that material out of there. I've seen them work. I was amazed at how fast they can move that stuff. It's really impressive. It's an impressive piece of equipment, absolutely. Okay, so. so we're going to make that amendment that's going to say tornado. The language. It'll be a tornado-related storm cleanup, yeah. Damage. Yeah. Um, do we have any motion on this? And six. I move that we recommend a place and recommend Article Six with the amended language uh, for tornado. Uh, okay. Uh, related. Uh, so we have a second expenses. on that. I'll second that. All right. So we have a motion to approve to place and place approve and Article Six with the amendment that. These expenses shown in this article are related to the tornado. So any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? And it passes 4 to 0. Make article 7. I'll make a motion we place Article 7. Okay. Second. So we have a motion to place only Article 7 in reserve on recommendation. Right. We don't any, have any numbers or anything. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, I think we're going to have to decide on that at town meeting. Correct. Well, actually, I think if everything works right, we'll have one meeting before that. We can have a discussion after the bid estimates. In on but it won't make it into the yeah. warrant. Right. It won't. It will right. Not. Our That's recommendation correct. would not make it into the warrant. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, any further discussion on that? All those in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? That passes 4 0. We have no choice but to let. That's my understanding. Article 18 8, and Article we will 8. have a presentation. There was a presentation coming, that's correct. Okay, so we place Article, we have a motion to place Article 8 in a warrant without a recommendation at this time. We have a second? I'll second that. Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? So we're voting to what? Place, place, place eight on the warrant yeah. without okay. any recommendation because we haven't had a presentation yet on that article. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's just going to appear at this point. We don't know what we're going to do. Okay. So I'm voting. Mark votes yes. I vote <coughs> yes. Tracy, did you vote yes? Norm, did you vote yes? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's four zero on eight. On nine, that's the diff article. Make a motion that we place Article 9. Okay, motion to place Article 9. I'll second that. We'll second by Mark. Um, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Say aye. Anyone opposed? Will this be part of, this isn't part of zoning, right? So the planning board doesn't have a public no. hearing on this? No. Okay. But we will put a, like a small staff presentation at town meeting on this with the map so everybody's clear. All right, so nine will be placed, and that vote was four to zero. Mm. And that does it for the warrant. Okay. Sign election warrant. So 
So if I, I'm not sure, I double checked uh, the e uh, the communication, Mr. Chairman, on uh, from uh, Rick Manley. I did not see up to language. Ed just sent an email. He um, recounted that it was in a discussion, but not in in the email That's itself. So to be safe, let's put in the exact amount. The exact amount. That's what I thought. Uh, I'm going to credit and bring it right. To okay. Very good. Okay, what do we have on sign election warrant? We get we have. It's in the folder. Yeah, it's in the sign. That folder. That's correct. That? It's, yeah, everybody needs to sign that. So a motion to. Uh, Mark once we get the language it. down, we'll just need a motion to approve the ballot as presented. And with the number, so we're putting the number on. Look, you have to sign that. The last question I have on there, apparently the last special town meeting started at 7 o'clock, mm -hmm. and I was going to get your input as to would you prefer to start that at 6 o'clock? Well, I would. I would, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I know, but people used to uh, argue that they didn't have time to go home and eat yeah, dinner after dinner, work. I know, I got a lot of those. So uh, that was, so. I mean. Yeah. Personally, for me personally, it's fine, but I'm not sure the public at large. I think we want to get people there, and I think if you start it after dinner time, you're apt to get more people there. Like Tracy said, with me, I don't really care either way, but I think we should leave it at 7. Okay. It's because it has to go to print. That's why I asked tonight. So. Um, it's not a long warrant. It shouldn't take a no, long it shouldn't. time. I don't anticipate It's going to be dark either way at that point. It's going to be dark either yeah. way. So, I mean, if it was the argument of people not having to drive in the dark then it'd be in favor of moving it up but yeah. i'm not sure it's going to make a difference okay yeah. we'll go back to seven then yeah, i think i think okay. we should bring it up again though in the future because i do think well let's see how it goes there. and then you know we can adjust do there's a six huh does, does yep. they do six yep. yeah in fact at our last town meeting i made a huge plea i was on tv radio whatever place i could go to that were that would listen to me to urge people to get there early i had them the, i had people lining up and signing in at 5 30 5 o'clock and the place was packed remember now we're at that at that meeting we were dealing with marijuana well, yeah, they were just language. chill. They had nowhere else to go. <laughs> yeah, their snacks it, it and came along. It was a ban <laughs> on retail sales. They served Fritos and <laughs> everyone was happy. <laughs> yep, there you go. Okay. So the new... I don't know. You know, the was, new. There, was there any, was there any um, discussion about that in the... Um, Survey Monkey that we sent out about town meeting? I don't recall if there was any specific on the operating plan. I don't remember. Yeah. I think nothing. they were more dealt with whether you wanted to stick with the Saturdays or go back to But evenings. they did have time questions. They think it was to shorten it up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they recommended we do the two meetings to shorten it up. Yeah. In fact. Okay, so this, this um, article language has been amended to insert... Well, I'll just it's, it's short, so it'll say, shall the town of Yarmouth be allowed to exempt from the provisions of Proposition 2 and a half, so-called, the amounts required to pay for the bond issued to pay an $18,079,475 portion of the total cost of constructing, originally equipping and furnishing a new Department of Public Works garage and office space to be located at 507 Buck Island Road, West Yarmouth, Mass, 02673, including the payment of all costs, incidental or related thereto. And then yes or no. And then the, on the point Tracy uh, made with publication, and it says, the, and also by publication in the Yarmouth Register or Cape Cod Times at 14 days before the time of holding said meeting as aforesaid. So looks good. Can you make a motion to approve that? Sure. You're making a motion to approve this amended ballot language. Um, do we have a second? I'll second it. Okay. So so there is no up to in there? No. No, it's going to be the, the stated the number of okay. the, the same as in the warrant, $18,079,475. Okay. Um, and the publication was rectified to say 14 days prior to the meeting. So we have a motion. Who seconded that, Mark? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any further discussion? 
All those in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? So that passes 4-0. Okay, good. And we'll Thank you. No, uh, I don't. Uh, All you right, don't actually, done. there is, a, you, got, you signed it right here. It's a signature page right there. We're all done with town council. You're all done. No Good questions. Done with you. 24, yeah, take, take all of it you want. Thanks for being here. Have a Thank safe you. ride back. Board and committee actions. Uh, no. If you, if I may, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, before we go forward, I didn't know. I do have the uh, debt schedules on the building, on uh, 25 and 30 year borrowing. If you wanted a brief commentary from the finance director on that, well, or just put them in your hands, and you can, we could talk about it next meeting. What would you. be your preference? You want to defer to the next meeting? Take the copies. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah. Mark, yeah. Why don't you pass the. <laughs> those out and we'll put that on the next agenda how's that that sounds great okay thank you some appointments do we have uh, are we doing budget policy or is that oh geez yeah that was uh, kind of taken out of the border so the budget policy is oh, in no, the packet skip that yeah no, issues for budget policy for fy 21 no we skipped that to get to the uh, right the matters that town council was going to help us with so it's the same standard policy that we've had the last two consecutive years um, that's just the dates have been changed and also uh, there's a budget schedule calendar that goes with that, and I believe Rich has one amendment that will be made to the calendar based on feedback from capital budget today. policy statement uh, I do okay. um, I'm um, concerned with uh, uh, section 2 with regard to the increase um, I mentioned uh, in an email to you Mike and, and to Dan today um, uh, you know, I've heard from any number of people that are feeling a lot of dis distress with their, their tax burden uh, and with the uh, continuation of 2.5% increases, um, people that are having to consider whether they can remain in Yarmouth um, and uh, whose incomes are, are uh, not going up by 2.5%. And I guess, you know, one of the things I had asked uh, was, do we have a report showing what our uh, revenues uh, were for the last uh, several years? And Ed sent me a report, Ed Sentio sent me a report on that. Um, and um, I guess I was a little uh, surprised uh, by the fact that <coughs> our revenue budget for 2020 budget uh, was less than 2019. I'm sorry, not less than two. Yeah, less than 2019 budget for uh, for local receipts, and about two million dollars less than the actuals in 2018 and. Uh, and 19, actually it's almost $3 million less uh, than 2018. And, <clears throat> you know, if you look at the actuals uh, for 2019, our revenue budget is uh, for 2020 was 18199199000 Our actual uh, revenues are 21325000 So 
uh, our budget uh, effectively um, was lower by about three million dollars than what it actually our revenues actually came in on, and uh, that has certainly resulted in, uh, in in at least contributes significantly to our free cash. Um, what I what I was really disappointed with was the fact that our budget projection for 2020 was $10,000 less than our budget for 2019. And that was in face of four years of continual $1 million increases in actual revenues. So it, it just seems to me we've been very conservative in our revenue projections. And as I went down the line, it appears to me that we could have easily bumped up our revenue projections um, for 2020 by a million three hundred thousand dollars. And I think we need a statement in our uh, 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 budget uh, directive that recognizes that we need to see a full budget, including, including all revenue projections, and that uh, those revenue projections have got to be uh, more in line with uh, uh, the actual uh, experience. Uh, a million three difference uh, would have eliminated so much angst at the end of last year in terms of uh, 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 budget increases. Um, and you know, a 2% increase in, in our, our total budget is, what, about a million dollars uh, for our municipal side. Um, so, you know, it, it looks to me like our, 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 our budget could have been, instead of a 2.5% increase in all expenses, a 1.5% increase in all expenses, and we still would have had plenty of room. So, you know, I'm very concerned about the continual um, uptick at 2.5% rate in uh, our expenditures, as expressed in our uh, policy statement. And when our revenues have been increasing and we, and, you know, we, we've tucked that away in, into stabilization funds for a few years, and, and I agree with that. I'm not, I'm not uh, disputing the need to do that. But now is the time, I think, uh, to, to make our revenue projections more in line uh, with the, uh, the trends and to uh, give the benefit of that uh, trend to our taxpayers. So, uh, you know, and not, uh, not end up with a huge uh, free cash surplus uh, at the end of the year, but rather leave the money in our taxpayers' pockets. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, I know this information was sent to us, but I wasn't necessarily prepared to have a conversation or a discussion about revenue estimates and how we go about doing it. I think it's a valid point. What I'd like to do is, is maybe at least not vote on this policy or act on this policy until we have a chance to kind of get, get up to speed a little bit more with some of the points that uh, Norm made. I think there's some, um, these are important points and I'd, I'd like to make sure that we all have the opportunity to have not only a chance to review the numbers but also maybe have a discussion <coughs> with our finance team on the estimating because we're talking about a practice over several years. So I think right. it warrants a bit more discussion rather than anything I'm prepared to have tonight. I'm, I'm looking at this three-page document in front of me, or four-page document, right. thinking that this is what we're going to talk about. I'm not suggesting that the points that are made are not important ones. They are. Um, but I think uh, we all should be sort of working from a certain learning curve so that we can all participate in this discussion. But to, to, to the point, I'm, I'm comfortable with this policy statement the way it's written. I understand Norm's points. I, there's a lot of variables that go into projecting and I'm sure there's rationale as to why they did their budget uh, estimates at the numbers that they did. But this clearly says that we take a conservative approach 
and it may include an increase of up to two and a half percent up to may so, and we changed I mean, that a few years ago. as we as we hone in on our budget I think that that discussion is valid but in terms of the statement in general to go and disperse to our staff I think that that is our policy is that we would like them to be conservative and do it within the constraints of two and a half and you know if we get to the point where we uh, that doesn't preclude us from saying okay let's look at the estimates at budget time and not increase the two and a half percent levy that doesn't it, we still could do that so since I've arrived it was explained to me that the policy on revenue projection has been 95% uh, average of the prior year actual um, that is conservative and where I came from we used to do 98 or 99 percent which in the beginning part of a budget process allowed you to have a little bit more flexibility and I came from a community that rarely taxed at two and a half percent so that's more of a political question for the policymakers than it is for me to answer but I do need clear direction as to how we can craft that and certainly as we go down we can provide a couple of scenarios at like 98 percent of revenue actuals uh and, and calibrate what the budget would look like like that and then that way you could see how much levy capacity we would need to make to meet our obligations at that point so there's a variety of different ways and you know my own personal philosophy on free cash was that uh, if you paid your bills and uh, you were moving your community forward, if you had some money left over, I share Selectman Holcomb's point of view that largely that came from the taxpayers, and if you're in a position to send some back, you ought to. Um, but that's my own personal philosophy on the topic. But I, I need, in the position I'm in, clear direction from the board as to how you'd like us to address those revenue issues. I am very carefully monitoring excise tax I, I talk about this all the time that is one of the first canaries in the coal mine right. when the when the budget starts to go soft you see it usually in your excise tax numbers and I don't think the year-over-year -year growth was as significant and there's been some some conversation GDP has been a little bit off and we've heard some nervousness on the Cape about all the taxation that came to us so I I can't find fault with a very conservative philosophy that the town's taken it's definitely demonstrated we've come back in a really robust fashion I think from the um, from the recession the depths of the recession but to Selectman Holcomb's point is there comes a time for policymakers to decide the level of taxation and when maybe the community's had enough and that maybe right. now is the time well we have some projects we have to you know we're looking at the DPW we're looking at a school project if not two right. I mean we have to be very very cognizant on the needs and the, uh, the as he pointed out the people that are really struggling and they've already you know they've already seen increases so one of the big wild cards since I've been in town that's really been difficult to manage is clearly the DY school budget mm -hmm. so hopefully if we get this new agreement uh, over the finish line and we get true meaningful relief like what's being talked about with the new ed reform bill come into town perhaps over the next three to five years that uh, big elephant in the room if you will will be restrained to some degree and then we could actually have a, a more robust conversation about property tax relief it's this isn't the only problem in communities I, I think many in the last 15 years have gone from some number of like less than 30 percent of your community financed off property tax to somewhere closer to 50 percent now so just about every community in the commonwealth is struggling with the same conversation we're having here tonight i make a motion we support and uh vote to recommend the policy select and policy statement put in front of us for fy 2021 we have further second. discussion. We have a second. We have no second. Um, let's go back to Norm's point for a minute. Norm, what? How far back did they go in terms of giving you those numbers? How many years? Two thousand sixteen. Oh, two sixteen. Uh, right. Sixteen through that's twenty. That's right. Yes, that's right. Okay. Uh, well, uh, 2020 is a budget projection right. uh, at this stage, but 2019 uh, included the actuals uh, through uh, June 30th. 
And uh, during that, in 2016, uh, the total of, I'm not including septage because that's an enterprise fund, but uh, local receipts were 19.3 million in 2016. They were 21.3 million uh, in 2019, so that's an, an increase of about $2 million or 10% over that period of time. Um, and, um, but when you look at our, our full year budget for uh, 2019, it was 18.2 million. So it was less than even 2016 actuals. And our 2020 budget was 18, <clears throat> 18.2 million as well. So that's even less than 2016. Again, we did have discussion about those things. I'm not implying that that was done, you know, behind some screen and, you know, with bells and whistles and all that. Not implying that. We, we had a, a, a policy in which we were uh, carefully uh, uh, adding to our uh, stabilization funds so that our future would not be uh, uh, mortgaged. So, you know, we, we had... Uh, good reasoning for doing that in, in a period of time. But our, our, we have a very healthy free cash uh, uh, balance this year. Uh, and again, I think it's time that we uh, uh, take a different tack with regard to our revenue projections. <clears throat> Not suggesting that, that uh, we make a, uh, uh, a wholesale move to, to Budgeting at, at the same amount as uh, we uh, are, uh, had for 2019 actuals, but uh, someplace in between. And I, as I said, I, I think we certainly could absorb another million three, and that would have a significant favorable impact uh, for our taxpayers. How do you feel about? Um, I know, think the statement number that, nine norm with in, in with. In the context of what you said, would you make any changes to number nine with f committing free cash up to a million in unrestricted stabilization? Um, up to? No. I, I think the statement says up to. I think that's fine. Uh, you know, I think it's what, whatever we can do. But, but I think that um, uh, uh, th there needs to be, in my view, some additional wording in, in paragraph two. Um, and uh, and I think uh, the additional wording is something sim to the point that um, uh, revenue uh, projections uh, should be constructed and presented to the board um, uh, for inclusion in the budget so that we can, because typically we don't look at these. We don't look at this as part of our uh, oh, We have the estimated discussion. revenue receipts here. We Always. Yeah. Yeah. But we, like I said, it's been based on 95%, right. a very conservative approach, and some, yeah. some communities really push the envelope on there. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we'd, we'd go overboard on No, we could certainly do that, something like 90, could good. give you like a 98% look at what it would mm -hmm. look like, you know? Well, how, how urgent is it to get some action on this? Well, I'd like to at least get this component off so I can get the instructions out to the department heads. They're already starting to do salary estimations and whatnot, and we're only we're like one meeting schedule behind anyways. But, I mean, as it relates, if you wanted to give some, we won't get to the point of needing to know a revenue estimate construct that you would like to use for another month or thereabouts. So if you would like to give that some thought, we can have a further discussion perhaps after town meeting on that. But certainly by the time we put the budget together, I'm, gonna, I'm due to deliver it to you by the calendar before uh, the end of December. And that would be like the last big component that needs to be filled in before we deliver it. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, w with respect to revenue estimating, I'm, if we're going to revisit that and look at that, I think we need more time. From the way in which the estimating policy is characterized tonight, uh, it's a very sound approach in terms of financial management. I don't, I don't want anybody to think differently. This is, falls within the guidelines of the Department of Revenue and other people that work with municipalities on finances. This is a sound approach to financial management. 
and I would be very, be very reluctant to change. Um, but when I look at some of the numbers here that have been identified, I'm looking at the number one issue in town that we have to address, and that's clean water. And I honestly believe that to the extent, and again, it follows a little bit on some of your commentary, Norm, about making sure that we deal with some of the big ticket items that are facing us straight in the face. Um, this board stepped up on OPEB. It's done it on other things. I think I would like, to the extent that we can make a change or adjustment, I think it's worth discussing how can we adjust this a bit to make clean water a priority. Uh, I know Tracy has mentioned this at other meetings about the importance of using some of that short-term rental money in a, in, a, in a capital account or a stabilization account. Um, I think that's worth, before, before we close the books on this policy, I'd like to at least have more discussion on how clean water expenses, how this could perhaps be addressed a bit more because I'm looking at it and it's, it's not here. Um, and I think, quite frankly, um, this, is a, this is a good document. I'm not critical of, of much of it at all. 95% of it is, is right on target. Um, my only issue is, is given what we're facing right now with respect to clean water and some of the expenses associated with that, th those infrastructure costs, maybe we need to find a way to address in this statement that crisis or that challenge that's confronting us as well. Maybe we need to allocate a portion of money for, those, for that purpose. I, I, you know, I, I'm certainly not interested in proposing an allocation of general fund revenues currently existing uh, to uh, wastewater. Uh, I think that uh, that uh, taking tax dollars from people who are not going to participate in uh, wastewater and who believe that they uh, will have their own costs in their private sewer septic systems uh, is something that uh, is a policy issue that uh, I think has been addressed by, town, by the town voters previously. And, I, and this we're not talking about incremental revenues, uh, which is uh, um, uh, ex taxes that have uh, been passed that we have not yet started to realize. We're not talking about that. We're talking about existing um, uh, revenues on existing tax policies and, and existing fees. Um, and uh, I think those should be returned to the taxpayers. Well, I don't think we're going to resolve anything on, on this number two tonight unless we include some generic language that talks about uh, consideration or re reassessment of revenues projected revenues that would go into this equation. In terms of a specific number or percentage, I think Mark's right when he says we would have to have a separate agenda item on this and to get some presentations probably from from staff and particularly Ed Centeo and then get Norm's analysis and then there's policy decisions, as Norm just raised, whether you should be using general revenues for things like wastewater or whether wastewater is such an important project that that militates against um, what he said. So, um, Well, Dan has a staff that has needs direction on where to go, and there's nothing in that policy that's been given to us that precludes any of that on how they build their budget, how we fund it, and how it's funded is a completely separate conversation. I, I think what Norm's saying, and Norm certainly can speak for himself, but I think what he's saying is the the revenue projections, which are part of uh, part and parcel of the budget, are not really included in item two. Is that your position, Norm? That's correct. So. Um, I guess if we want to have something done for tonight, if we added some language to that effect, that um, that that the departments will justify, um, you know, revenue 
the easiest way to do it, frankly, if we've been using 95% average on revenue receipts, tell me 98% and we'll do it 98%. Well, we can, I don't think we can do that. With I mean, that's kind of the rabbit's foot approach. Um, I, I think you got to have some serious discussion about how it is that you would arrive at a 98% and what effect that would have on all these other um, allocations that have been made it, out of free it, cash. No, it won't. It won't have that. It, it's a, It's part of it. So I, when I would do this before, I would provide tax relief at the time in which you set the tax rate. Because one of the challenges with this form of government is you only have typically one bite at the apple on your appropriation, which is at town meeting. So if you undershoot it, and some communities do, they're at fall town meeting with supplemental appropriations. This town has done an exceptional job not having ever had that problem in recent memories. Okay, that being said, my own personal very conservative approach on this topic is it's best to be conservative on these revenue receipts because you never really know as, you know, we're putting this thing together you know, 18 months before you'll see a final report as it relates to the actuals, okay? So I would never want to be short on that because it's it's really problematic to get additional money if you run short. Second to that is at the end of the year when you're, when you're looking at the books and before you set the tax rate, you can put the money back into that process to reduce the 2.5% allocation. And, and routinely, that's how the community I came from would do this we would make a recommendation to the legislative body to funnel back in two million or one and a half million or two and a half million dollars to reduce the levy uh, raise that was gonna be done. That is the safest way to ensure that you do it, such that you don't run short of your annual appropriation. And that is my one concern, is because we only have one, maybe two chances for an appropriation, I would not ever wanna run short. And because of the DY budget wild card, and I and I don't believe they've settled their contract situation yet. Um, right. So we continue to be in a scenario where we're going to be very concerned as we move through the winter as to what that ramification would look like. You know, we're in pretty good shape contract side here. We do have some that have to go down that road a little <coughs> bit later this year, but. Personally, my own belief is the better time to do this is at the end of the cycle when you know how much money is in the bank. Yeah, I think uh, uh, the what I am very concerned about is that we commit to funding expenses out of an increase in revenues, uh, pr revenue projections that um, uh, is certainly already there and 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 eat up what I, I think could be money that you know, should be returned to the taxpayers. Um, you know, uh, I think we've got to be very um, careful in our projections of expenses that uh, we don't have, um, that we don't, uh, let's say we have an increase in utilities or pension and, and health and general insurance and those line items that way exceeds 2.5%. We've got to come up with that money someplace else. Well, we'll know I'm, those before we actually present the final budget to the voters. So that's, you know, that's one of those things as we make last-minute adjustments going into Springtown meeting. That is certainly something that we deal with. And then if, if it looks like, you know, I'm just going to use this as a complete hypothetical, but say you were at 2.5% and you needed to find some extra money because you had a retirement assessment or a health insurance assessment that was larger than you had estimated, uh, then you would look to your revenue receipts to, to address that mm -hmm. that way. And you, but you can't, you can't fudge it to the point where it's not realistic either. I mean, the DOR will review that. So... You know, I mean, I, I've seen in uh, in the last downfall in 07, 08, the precipitous decline of uh, excise tax was gargantuan year over year. And, and that's the type of thing that, you know, you, you, you guard against that. But, you know, we do have generally pretty good estimates going in. But in the end, that's why it's nice to have some extra free cash and some stabilization that if your appropriation fell really short, you'd have mm -hmm. those those things to fall back on um, but I mean, but this like I said this form of government because we have such a limited chance to do an appropriation is you, you don't want to run short that's mm -hmm. why I think the town's been so conservative I guess the other uh, concern I have is that uh, the communication uh, or conversation 
seems to be that, well, 2.5% is affordable. Uh, and it's not affordable for, our, for many of our taxpayers in this town. And I think we've got to uh, dispense with that assumption that our taxpayers can, can absorb continual increases in our budget of 2.5%. And, uh, you know, I, and I guess that's the reason, uh, you know, w we, we put in wording of up to, but it's, but it's uh, you know, the up to is, is with regard to uh, DY -E and Cape Cod uh, Tech. That's for, it's the so town budget. It doesn't say that. It does. It says we'll provide for essential town services. It does not say may include an increase for town services of that amount. It says may include an increase of up to 2.5% for DY, uh, DY and So it does not provide for a 2.5% increase in general uh, town services. So what's your argument then? Um, well, uh, because the conversation has been otherwise. Well, I think when all the puzzle pieces fit together, like I said, the DY budget has been a buster for us. Right. Uh, if you took that scenario out of the equation or if they were comfortably within, like, you know, similar to Cape Tech has been very comfortable with year-over-year uh, -year appropriation since uh, uh, I've been here. We don't have that same reliability, so you know that that is an enormous number that we've had to pick up the the pieces on, not leaving much on the town side. And I think you've heard, you know, uh, from YPD, there's always an increased pressure there. YFD is telling me they would like to fund four additional positions based on call volume. You know, all, we've we've really held. Uh, the, the wall back a little bit on all these requests, but at some point, yeah, certainly, uh, you know, the police appropriation for expenses has been hovering around 200000 for maybe longer than before I even arrived here in town. And we have contractual you know? obligations. And we do. And, and, you know, so there's all of those pressures that come at us at different ways. And I've, like I said, my own personal philosophy is I've never guaranteed 2.5% to anybody. Mr. Um, Chairman, if there's so. no motion and no second or no suggestion, can we just move on? We're not going anywhere. Well, I think the discussion is beneficial um, because we got to resolve this, if not tonight, at some point in time. Right. Um, and I agree with you that we have to conclude this shortly. Well, what's the but, suggestion? How do we resolve Well, I want to see what, I guess that's the point. I want to see what people think they want to do from here. Um, I, you know, I guess at this point I would look to uh, <clears throat> Dan and the staff to provide uh, alternate scenarios to the typical approach that we've had in the past and, and uh, with some, some alternate uh, calculations that, uh, from the 95%. I don't believe we were at the 95% last year. I don't think the 2020 budget was constructed at that level. Yeah, when we built it, I'm pretty revenues. sure that it was because that's the guidance that I've operated since I've been here. Well, I, I, I don't know how it came out at uh, less than the previous year budget. Because I think you're looking at the recap at the end of the year. I'd have to, I, Ed generated that report, so that may be somewhat different than the estimates that we went into the budget I with. I, I, all I'm that, saying is that, that's That's the report that we send to you all every month, right. which shows the revenue trend amount. Yep. Yes. What was the percentage you used last year? Well, we were up to uh, exactly 95%, but then because we didn't need as much money because of the DUI situation, what I did instead of having excess levy capacity was reduce the local receipts. And that was in the email that I sent you today okay. to you and uh, the chairman. So uh, since 2016. Did we get this email? No, I'll send it to you as well. Since I, I think if you could send it to all the board yeah. members, that would Because the great. tax rate went from $10.10 down to $0.10. Cents. Yeah. Since 2016, have you applied the same rate of 95%? We have been around that amount because that's in your financial policies. 
and it was on a three-year basis. What does that mean on a three-year basis? On an average of a three-year basis, okay. applying 95%. So if you could reread that email, and then we could dialogue about it, that would be great. So you're saying that, let's say, in this year you did a projection, it would be on an average of the prior three years at 95%? Correct. Is Correct. that how you did it? And, and then we have to look at, as um, uh, 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 Town Administrator um, Kanapik said, where was um, motor vehicle excise? Motor vehicle excise was at 96%. When we went through the recession and we had to lay off um, individuals in the town, motor vehicle excise uh, dropped precipitously. Um, and that's why uh, finance department is down 10% from where we were in uh, 2010. And we haven't hired any additional staff. We're looking out for those trends. I think you probably all have heard about um, the, the fact that um, the yield curve is inverted. The yield curve being inverted in the last seven times it's happened has forecast a recession. Um, so, you know, you, you have to take into consideration all of those factors. Again, well, well, having gone through significant issues like that uh, in my time here and having to deal with, you know, the reduction in staff and existing staff taking on more work, I'm very keenly aware of what happened when your local receipts go down. Before Look, you I, go, I, Norm, you know, I just have one other question. What, if any, effect by adjusting this, and I'm not suggesting you should, I'm just asking yep. this theoretical question to 90, say, 97 and a half, 98 percent. Right. What effect, if any, would that have on on your position with the bond rating? Uh, you know, what, one of the, uh, the only item where we're not um, the highest rating possible is the amount of free cash we spin off. That's where we're deficient. Uh, we, at the time, we were also deficient um, because the uh, local economy score was down. That's so you're why we got. It could have a negative effect in that regard. That yeah, Definitely. that is the only factor where we have a negative effect. Management is at the highest level. Uh, our reserve policies are at the highest level. All of that is in great shape, except for the amount of leeway that we have in our expense budget. Okay, go ahead, Norm. Okay, five percent of our local receipts is about a million dollars. The 2017 to 2019 uh, revenues were uh, roughly $21 million average. Sure. So if we budgeted at 5% less than that, it would be at 19, I'm sorry, $20 million. That isn't where we budgeted. We budgeted at 18.2 million. Okay. And all I'm suggesting. Yeah, can can we have a conversation tomorrow? Sure. Do you have time? Sure. Uh, all right. Uh, I don't know if I do tomorrow, but 10, 11 uh, o'clock at night. That's, that's how long I work. 12 o'clock if you want. 8 o'clock in the morning. Anytime. I. I can't do it at 8 o'clock in the okay. morning. No. Mm -hmm. It'll have to be sometime in the afternoon. Yep. Saturday or Sunday. Yep. I'm here. Can we carry this discussion on this over to the next meeting? I don't want to I don't want to bring it over a long time to make a federal case out of it, but can It'll we It'll appear again on the next agenda. Can we put this on sure. the next yeah, agenda absolutely. to wrap it up? Yep. And um, we'll give you some revenue trend reports too. Chairman, if I may as well. Uh, just a consideration. Uh, all these questions with regards to the revenue side of the budget. Uh, I've worked with Ed for a number of years. I'm, we've got great explanations and reasons for a lot of it, and it's a matter of communicating that. But what's in front of you and what the direction that we need on the budget for the departments is really on the expenditure side, which I believe almost all of these points are addressing the expenditure side for departmental guidance. So perhaps uh, a solution for moving forward would be to give some guidance on the expenditure side with the understanding that we need to get you the information on the revenue side on how we actually fund the budget once we come up with the expenses. I have a quick question for Rich and for Dan. Are we talking about in terms of um, municipal budgets sticking within the 2.5%? Is that what we're... Is that the recommendation here? Well, yeah, so the recommendation in general that goes out to the departments mm -hmm. is adjust for salary obligations mm -hmm. based on contracts yep. and level fund expenses. If you have something that's pressing that you need to address 
from an appropriation beyond yeah. your normal expenditure, you need to come in and see me about yeah. that. And then if that's the case, we find an offset. So that's the general, that's how we frame it every year since I've been here. Yeah. And, and I don't have any problem with that, with that yeah. communication. No, neither do I. And I think yeah. that's, and I think on the expenditure side, I think, uh, I, would, would you say this, Mr. Chairman, that we're all in agreement with that? Yes. And that's what I'm suggesting. Yeah. And then when, then we get to the question that Selkman Holcomb has and others as to how we're funding that, and we can still have that right. discussion. Nothing here precludes that. Right. I think okay. the, the thing, the, the two key things that I just want to leave behind before we close th this topic is that um, I think the revenue conversation is a good one. I think it's healthy. I just want to have access to the information sure. that everybody Absolutely. else has. I don't Absolutely. want to be sitting here blind with a conversation going on that I know very little about. So I think in the future, it would be helpful to get that kind of information for everybody. So I look forward to seeing what's been distributed and going over it. Um, uh, the, the other, the other the point that I want to make is that um, I have nothing but praise for the town's financial team. The revenue estimating is consistent with generally accepted good financial practices. And I think it's because this town has been so well managed by this finance team that we're in the situation that we're in right now where we have some resources that, uh, that's worth talking about uh, in terms of how best to utilize those. The only thing that I'm suggesting is that since we're talking about FY21, is going in, is there a way, and, and this is maybe where the board also has to have a separate discussion, given clean water and the infrastructure costs going forward, would it make sense to set aside funds for stabilization capital related to water and wastewater infrastructure? Uh, we have to have this conversation. Again, we're looking at FY21. I'm going to keep raising it, keep talking about it. I'll keep putting wastewater financing on the agenda. Um, in the cost recovery plan, we do allocate a certain amount of cost recovery to utilizing local receipts. I don't see this as alien from, uh, from this topic. I think it's entirely germane. So um, I think it's worth a healthy discussion uh, among, among the members of this board on the revenue side as to how best to allocate some of those dollars, knowing how critical clean water and wastewater is. So. Um, I'm going to keep bringing this up until we can get some consensus or at least some closure on it. Mr. Chairman, to that point, I could also say again, the clean water issue uh, is uh, while important, we gotta, we'll address it. It's not part of the day-to-day -day operating budget guidance that we need for the departments. And I certainly, as I work with Ed and, and the town administrator on the budget, we already had a commitment in, in the financing plan did identify local receipts as a funding source, but to the extent they were new. And so as we go through this upcoming process to Selectman Holcomb's point and to Selectman Forrest's point, I think we can accommodate both those viewpoints by carving out new revenues going towards race, wastewater. Um, but I don't think any, either of those preclude providing guidance to the departments. Well done. So what do you want to do? You want to defer this to? I think we should bring this up another at another meeting. meeting. And, I, and I think North to the extent that the board has provided guidance on the expenditure side so that they can start working with department heads I'm on the I'm fine budget. with this. I think we need to have further discussion on revenues. Okay. I think it, it just stands as fine, but I think we need to have further discussion on the revenues uh, with regard when to. When you say this fine as it stands, do you want to? Um, approve this and then have a, a, a follow-up discussion on revenues or do you want that's, to wait that, that would be my preference in? at this stage yes is that we endorse this what's that approve this this is what right all right so and you're making a motion to that effect norm yes and we approve this um selectman's policy statement dated september 24 2019 yes. okay and you have a second um i i, I i'll second it but i i want to stress again I mean, I anticipate there will be new receipts in FY21. My hope is that we can find ways to start allocating funds for clean water part of as our, consistent with the cost recovery plan. Part of our work on the revenue side that we'll be discussing will be what's our projection for short-term rental taxes, what's new versus what's the old tax, so to speak. Yeah. 
Okay, I'm going to insist on so finding a way then, we can identify what that number is. We'll be getting actual reports from the Department of Revenue on okay. actual collections yeah. on the new right. what's new versus what's existed in the right. past. I think as a board we need to talk about that, though. I think that's right. Okay. I think you're right. Yes. Okay. I agree. Very good. I agree. So I've got a second here. Okay. So we have a motion and a second to approve the selections policy statement of September 24th, 2019, as it is written. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The pass is three to zero, which is a unanimous vote. Um, okay. I thought that would only take a couple of minutes. Actually, uh, you know, Mr. Chairman, I no, think, good I, I think, I think this is very all very, very helpful discussion. I think each of the points brought up were They're very all legitimate, good, all They're entirely points. appropriate, and it's worth a discussion. I agree. And um, sometimes financial management and revenue estimating can be an arcane and sometimes confusing and complicated business. But uh, like I said, in this town, I think. Um, they do a remarkable job. So, but I'm I'm anxious to get into the weeds with you, Norm. All right. Okay. Okay. Good. I'll stay out of them. <laughs> um, board and committee actions, committee appointments. Okay. We've I got. Think a, we have some. Yeah, you've got a fairly full packet of uh, candidates for a number of positions. Let's start with planning board. Ready? Ready. Yep. All right, so we have before us, I'm recommending that Joanne Crowley and Chris Vincent, be both of them be reappointed as regular members to the planning board for three-year terms running through July 2022. I so moved. moved. Well, go ahead. Norm moves that appointment. I'll second it. Okay, any discussion? Uh, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. The next item is for um, a woman named Elizabeth Hartsgrove. Some of you may be familiar <laughs> with this woman. Yeah, she used to be uh, administrative yep, assistant to our yep. town administrator. She's the uh, pl assistant planning director for the town of Barnstable, and she's moved back to Yarmouth. Back to Yarmouth. Ah, so we've wonderful. recruited her to come back and serve on the planning board Good. as a regular member, and this will be for an appointment for three years running through July 2022. I'll move that appointment. Second. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. It carries. Motion she was carries. instrumental in uh, uh, getting the, um, what do you call the facings on the electrical boxes all over town. Yes. Uh, the, uh, right, right. right. Uh, she has, and, uh, yeah, she can, it's amazing. She can do amazing work. And she's doing great things in the town of Barnstable. So having her on the planning board right. is going to be a huge asset. The next item before you is... Um, Housing. The uh, no community preservation committee. This would be to reappoint Marianne Walsh as the housing authority oh, representative okay. to the community preservation committee, and this is for a three-year term running through July 2022. I'll move that appointment. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, now for the uh, the big ticket item of the evening. That's why Jane is here at this uh, late hour um, to fill in anything that I might miss or uh, need some help on. So this is the library planning committee that the board established uh, some time back to provide <laughs> guidance and help facilitate consensus on recommendations on our, our long-term facility needs with respect to libraries. So. Um, we had a number of applicants to serve, and so I'm presenting to you uh, George Bovino and Linda Callahan, uh, and I'm going to present them in the order of the staggered terms. So we'll start with the three-year terms, the two-year terms, and the one-year terms. So George Bovino and Linda Callahan for a three-year term expiring September 2022. I'll move those appointments. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It carries unanimously. The next uh, group of candidates would be Anne Marie Gavin, Susan Loveland, and Will Rubenstein for two year terms ending in September 2021. So moved. Appointments as well. Second? Yeah. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. And then Richard uh, Simon and Jack Moylan. Uh, 
to be run, to serve on the library planning committee for one year terms ending in September 2020. Remove those appointments. Second. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 And then uh, we had a, a late entry, in, but when, af right after the packet was done, Angela, her last name? Arbone. Arbone. If I may, Mr. Yes. Uh, we, the Forest. Buckley, is Buckley part of? I heard Buckley. Buckley, was Buckley is. Dino Callahan. Buckley is not, was not because Buckley uh, dropped out. Okay. okay. All right, so. Yeah, perfect. So Thank just you. so that you have that. Any other? Nope, that was it. Just okay. following along. Yep. So Angela Carbone, now you have to help me, Jane. She did a great interview. She's terrific for library stuff. The town library board. She wants to be on the library board, which also has an opening. They have an opening, so right. We, we thought we'd, we would talk about that at the next meeting. I think I should bring that up. We'll get you some background on her for the next meeting. I know something was sent out by email today, but we'll put it in the packet again, and we'll bring her up uh, at our next meeting. So let me see it. I'm, gl I'm glad that's worked out. She's inter interviewed very well. Okay, what else do we have? I think that concludes the uh, the committees. I think that's it. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hey, thank you. Um, approval of minutes for March 19th, 2009 and April 9th, 2019. I move to approve. Do we have a second? Second. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So that passes unanimously in executive session minutes for July 16, July 30, and August 13th, and also August 27th of 2019. I move we approve this. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? So that passes unanimously. Upcoming agenda review. So... We don't meet next week, do we? Nope. I don't think so. Uh, October 8th. So uh, a quick question I have for you on the 8th is uh, the Veterans Beach sticker policy. We're going to bring that back, okay. but we're going to bring it back as a, a proposal to provide a percentage discount. We're going to leave that discount blank. We're going to, it's a fee, so we're going to have to have two hearings on that by your own rules. So it'll start on the 8th. So somewhere between, I mean, there's obviously going to be a revenue impact to this, but we were thinking, I, uh, Mr. Colby left, but I think somewhere in the neighborhood of 20% uh, or thereabouts as a discount to trial the, because we don't know how many people would take advantage. We do know there's a lot of um, people with veteran status in town, and we also would frame the language such that it, it met the standard for honorably discharged veteran status. These were all commentary that was picked up from the last time we brought that forward to you. That's great. But it's um, kind of timely because uh, we got to get in position to get the sticker run in uh, the software formatted. So Yeah. So that's going to be... Oh, that's just that's on, the, on the eighth. Eighth, that's agenda. correct. Yeah, yeah. You, got, yeah. you got one page of the. And then the bottle, uh, single use uh, plastic bottle ban. Is that coming up? Next that's time? on the eighth, yeah. Rich, is there uh, an issue with the solar lease? Will that be. Uh, I, I saw some last minute hang ups on that. Yeah, I'm not sure what the timing of the latest issue is, but um, we do need to present to you leases for the proposal for 50 workshop road ground mount solar array and so the idea would be to give you a presentation on that and a draft of the leases and then a second meeting to actually vote on it so you'd have some time to consider um, but there was a snafu just late last week on that which I'm not sure, where yeah. I think we're still waiting from the vendor to respond. The size of the uh, array is a problem for Eversource, apparently, the way in which we're going to do the credits. So. <laughs> they always seem to have problems with yeah. these solar projects, don't they? Yeah. Th they'll yeah, also... Really. Something. Yeah. yeah. Of course. Go figure, it's, right? CVEC <laughs> no has also asked for a position on the agenda for their adder, their next uh, round of, uh, uh, of yeah. uh, adder discussion. So we should have something that's, that's all kind of coming together. That can sent to us in emails this week. Great. 
permitting guide should be available. The other one is the Ocean Club. I've spoke to this before. I'm not sure. I'd probably want to put that on when Jay's going to be back. That's another licensing agreement down on South Shore Drive. It's uh, like a retaining wall that was built back in the 1950s, a little sliver of town property. In order to do their construction, they would uh, they need some authorization from the town to make it uh, like it's okay to be on town property, and that's in a license agreement like you saw tonight. So we met with the applicant tonight, or uh, earlier today, and um, it, it would be like a revocable license situation. The only other way to do this for them would be to um, get authorization from town meeting to do a, a sale or a lease of property and then uh, have them respond to an RFP. Mm. And that seems to be a very cumbersome process for a very little amount yeah. of of uh, footage on the on the property it's probably uh less than half the square footage of this room i'd be willing to bet it's a, a very tiny amount so is there going to be revenue associated with this license well that's part of a discussion that you could have as it relates i mean it has been like this for a very long time and and it only recently came to light that it was encroached on on town property um but it is a, a seawall that they need to rebuild i guess is what the and story is on it so well you could give them a, a license which is basically just mere permission to that's use correct. that's rev revocable, revocable at the will of the town that's mm -hmm. correct i guess you could give them a, a lease as well i believe the lease though as of town of, of, of real property of would have to go to uh, would have to have a value well it'd have to have a value but it has to be authorized by town meeting which this would not I think you probably mm. have an appraisal too yeah oh absolutely yeah mm. yeah nice. well the other thing to consider i'm just using as a as a model the uh, the licenses that the Commonwealth issues for the use of public tidelands or other public property. I mean, those are, those are relatively common. So this is an area that has significant public access. I don't know if there's a potential public access benefit. I think there are two different kinds of licenses, though. When you get a license, usually, like, say, for a dock, you have the right to keep perpetually using. You have a, you no, I have understand. a vested I understand. I see. With, a, with a license. Well, that permits use, it gives the person using it the legal authority to do it, right. but it doesn't give them any vested property rights. Right. Mm. So no, that, I, I, that owner can say, you know, after a year, six months, tomorrow, stop. And it also prohibits the person using it for claiming that they own it by adverse possession right because exactly. adverse possession is kind of a trespassory use whereas with a license the person acknowledges that you've given them permission and therefore it's not adverse interestingly enough there was a case that was explained to us today by the engineer in brewster that the town authorized a license in brewster to a private property owner that has encroached <laughs> on town property. I said, so why don't you send that over to me and I'll mm -hmm. take yeah. a look at that language yeah. and see what so we got well, Brewster did. So yeah, I, I, I know. Cost I don't know. I'm going to find all that information out. So. <laughs> but that's uh, that's something I'll probably wait to bring the applicant in front of you before, and when Jay comes back and he can walk you through that. So, Is it is the site something that displaces any public use? Or public uh, no, it's, it's it literally, it's, it's literally like... The matter of uh, maybe it's the, the wall is, uh, I want to say it's like 100 feet long, and it's maybe on town property by a foot. I see. You know? That's all? Yeah, it's tiny, really tiny, yeah. We're going to give you a view uh, coming up from the water looking okay. at it, oh, so you'll good. get a good idea of what it's all about. So, so are we going to... What else are we going to put on for the 8th? Uh, so the permitting guide has been... Uh, this is a long-awaited goal that, uh, to help uh, streamline the process of applying for different permits in town. The guide has been f in a finished format and draft size for quite some time, and they'll be in front of you uh, on the 8th as well. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to keep these meetings in the three-hour time frame as much as possible. So. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, I will mention on October 22nd, it was uh, brought to my attention that we will need a golf fee increase. This is on p uh, cart fees and things like related to that uh, because we're up for a new lease for that equipment. And the uh, price that we presently charge doesn't accommodate the lease agreement. But Scott is ready for a presentation. The, the, what we did at town meeting was the annual fee for uh, general membership. And then I think it was just like one particular age bracket 
that uh, for kids and for uh, seniors. So there was a couple of other fees that uh, need to be uh, voted for a hearing, but he has all that information for you. So this is not for the next year's increase? It's not the general membership fee. It's very specific. It's like like cart fees. There's oh, uh, some other, okay. like, what I'd call incidental use of the golf. So when it, when do you anticipate that hearing? Well, so that's the 22nd would be the first one, and, and the way timing falls, November, we uh, we decided November 14th, right, is a Thursday night. Yeah. So that's when National Golf will be here, and Scott will have the second fee hearing on the 19th. I didn't think okay. doing okay. it on that same night would be. Um, so you'll so get an idea of the finances of golf by the 14th of November. So we'll have an idea of what the, the fees should be for the next year then. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is a, a proposal for next year. That's correct. But. Yeah. But, but, but the, it's not this. It's not the general membership fee that uh, was like twelve hundred and fifty or, right, or eleven right. fifty or whatever. It's different fees for like so, one of them so, was the cards. So that fee will be decided when? Oh, right. on the second meeting. So you'll you'll have the hearing and then whatever he's proposing. And on the second meeting, it appears again on November nineteenth is the okay. second meeting. So that would, but that will not include. The general membership. He's not, I don't believe he's proposing a general membership fee uh, increase at, at all. That's my understanding. I'll get a uh, memo to you in advance of the 22nd. It, it was as it was explained to me. It was the cost to cover among things was the lease for the carts, the cart charge, the daily cart charge, whatever that is. I don't know how much. So that, that lease is up, and there's an increase, and he wants yeah. to raise some money to, to cover to that. offset that cost. Yeah. So well, I had a meeting. Why with would we forego a five percent increase? I, I'm not sure, Norm. To be honest okay. with you, you know that's something that uh, you know he's running the operation over there, and it it may be that uh, it's calibrated enough to get him through for this upcoming year. I don't know. I don't have that detail. Okay. So, but I'm sensitive to the commentary I received. Uh, what was it last night? It seemed like forever ago we were out there, but uh, there's been a lot of commentary. So there, this but hearing on golf, w with respect to the latest um, study, is going to be on the 14th. On the 14th, and that there may only be one or two other items that night because it's a non-normal business night. I didn't want to yeah. keep you out that. Night. Is that going to be a public hearing? Oh, it's a public meeting, not a hearing, just a meeting. Public, yeah, public meeting. Yeah. So the report that was generated will come to us. It'll go in the pack. It'll be available for people online. And then, yeah. uh, and then uh, you know, it'll be part you, of the The reason I ask you that, usually people like the Golf Enterprise Committee and people like that like to be heard on those in that yeah. forum. And, yeah. And, well, and no, they, you certainly can have that commentary. I would like to, yeah. you know, give them that opportunity if that's what they wish to do. Yeah. No, you certainly can take in that feedback uh, after the consultant's yeah. report. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Now, one of the things we've done in the past on this type of thing is we've had the consultant provide the report in his findings, you've been given the opportunity to interact with the consultant. And at the next follow-up meeting, we've presented all this stuff to the individual stakeholders, and then they came back to talk to you. So it's a little bit more orderly. But I don't like to publish anything that, you know, it's your domain, so you get to see and hear the report from the consultant first. Okay. There's a couple of other things that will make their list here for next meeting. I know uh, Jeff Colby's got to come back as a Water Commission update sometime in November. Um, there's a few other things that have been percolating up. We have off December 24th this year. Yeah, you want uh, – I think 31st. there's a lot of – it's a busy night this year, yeah. Mark can cover those meetings. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> okay, anything else on that? All right, individual items. Mark, do you have anything? No. Norm? Uh, just one comment. We, we, we had, I think, a, a great reception at the uh, uh, Bass River Golf Course for uh, members, uh, and, and I thought that that went off real well. I thought the quality was good, and, and I think the evening, the, the weather cooperated, <laughs> so we had, uh, I, I think, a really good um, um, meeting. And uh, um, I, I want to emphasize something, uh, though, about uh, the golf course, Bass River, because I've, I've played there probably two or three times this year. I, I'm reluctant to go back. Um, every time I go, my equipment gets coated with geese droppings. My shoes get coated. I pick up a ball that's coated. It gets on my gloves. 
it, it gets on the handles of my golf clubs. I, it's extremely frustrating. And, and I know that it's frustrating for our management group as well, but believe me, it's a health problem. And to my way of thinking, whatever we've got to do with state agencies to stress that this is a serious health issue that needs to be addressed in some way, uh, we should do because it's just, uh, you know, you can't wash off your stuff at Bass River, and I it certainly can't get it off my golf clubs unless every time I go there, um, you know, I, I, I take home my clubs and, and wash everything. Um, and um, believe me, I come back and, and the wheels of my golf cart are totally coated. And, um, you know, it's, it's um, I know there's been some commentary from some of the other golf groups, um, but as I said, I'm very reluctant to play there. Um, so I, I just wanted to add some emphasis to that. And, um, you know, it's, it's not an easy problem. This is the day problem. of the seals and the geese, Lord. The geese. Uh, if we can get the sharks to take out some of those geese, it'd be great. <laughs> um, <laughs> That, that's so. been a problem, Norm, that's been existing for many, many years. I don't golf, but I can tell you I've coached soccer for yep. over 25 years. And when you first go out in those fields in the spring, especially at Mattakees, D.Y., fields like that, mm. it's the same thing. Yeah, it, it, same thing. it's it used to be, I, I thought, kids are running through that stuff and restricted to the spring. It's not. I mean, there, there's two or three huge flocks that uh, get on the course and, um, you know, they, it's, uh, it's disgusting. So. But they're migratory birds, and I think you have all kinds of federal protections that probably kick in, right, They Mark? are federally protected but species, I understand. Tree, yeah. yeah, that's right. So although there is a hunting season right now, it's a two-bird two bag limit for the hunter, and then later, a little bit later in the fall, it's, I think it goes to like 15 birds per hunter. So yeah. we'll try to make a dent in it later this year if that's yeah. uh, politically appropriate. Should we but all it is go out and hunt? Well, we have a couple of folks that uh, they like to take advantage of early morning activities at Bass River. <laughs> I, you know, I share Selectman Holcomb's uh, concerns. I, I literally just walk off the hole when uh, when I encounter such uh, obstacles. Yeah, it's disgusting. I, I pick up the ball and move move on. <laughs> yeah, it's just. Uh, Poor, these poor kids are playing in that stuff and yeah. running in that stuff and hitting the ball. Yeah. Yep. And the ball has been traveling through. Uh, this. Just, just, yeah. Yeah, I didn't even like to think about it. Maybe we should get into the border collie business. Right? Well, we do. We try to run the Mark, why don't you call your friends in Washington and see what you can do? Throw in a couple seats. I'd like to move the consent agenda. Okay, we have a motion to move the consent agenda. I'll second that. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? It carries unanimously. Are we done? Are we I got, uh, I just wanted to, we had a request by a, uh, a young student at uh, DY uh, for 3 o'clock on Friday to stage a climate change strike out at uh, public property in front of Town Hall. So he's anticipating. Ten of his fellow classmates will accompany him, and um, they would uh, do a traditional old-school, old-fashioned picket strike, I guess is what you'd call it. So um, it's a little bit of civics in action right in front of Town Hall, and I commend the young man for for uh, going about it in the lawful process, contacting Town Hall, asking for a form to get permission to do that, and providing us that information. So it ought to be interesting to see what happens on Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock on Route 28. Well, if he was a true, a true disciple of civil disobedience, he wouldn't ask for permission. That's true. That's what I was saying. That's why I wanted to comment. Just go out and do right. it and let the dogs get him. And, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I commend the young man for and, crafting a nice email to us requesting permission and what he needs to do to, uh, to accomplish that. Okay. Um, uh, other than that, I don't have any uh, other updates. We had something in the consent agenda. I just wanted to, uh, I can't find it, but there was a couple things from Seaside, Seaside Festival. Seaside Festival is coming up, that's correct. We wanted permission to use... Um, Town parking lot. Parking lot yep. for VIP. Yep. 
And there was another item they asked for. Um, uh, parade. To waive, was it waive fees? Yeah, permit parade permission. I don't know, it's something, but they, they just do a tremendous job. They really do. Um, they've done that for, I think, in excess of 40 years. It's unbelievable when you think about it. I remember when they first started, Jan Butler, she's still doing it. Yeah, she gave a nice uh, history of the origins Incredible. of the festival last year. So Who it was sticks with a project to... like that, a public project for 40 years? I mean, it's the, tough. the lady should yeah. be uh, commended for that, and, and her staff, they do a great job. They've invited us to participate in it, I suppose. We'll wait and talk to Mark, to, Mark, uh, to uh, Eric and Tracy about that. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We're adjourned.